Hey, it's John Carlos, and I'm here to talk about a movie with Eddie. Eddie. Because um, that's what we do. Talk about movies. Yes. And hot damn, do I love this <laughs> one. Night <sighs> of the Comet. My heart. Right? <laughs> um, this, even though it came out in 1984, and I'm a child of the 80s, this one 82. Was 82? I have 82 on IMDb. Oh. Okay. Maybe it was 82. I thought it was 84. Maybe. Oh, wait, but yeah, what's his name was talking about? He had a lot of good things going in 1984 in the uh, behind the scenes. Um, I can't remember the name. Uh, the one who does the, ma the makeup. The makeup guy. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was talking about doing it in 1984. So maybe IMDb got it wrong. And I could have sworn, is... I could have, because I had it on, you know, and like let the credits roll. And I could have sworn at the end it was 84. Okay, yeah, oh my credit. gosh! I, yeah, I think you're right. I think I am at least. I I think IMDb is wrong. When I, at least when I maybe I read it wrong. I don't know. Maybe. Seems unlikely. Well, Go in on, any case, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but even though I was a child of the '80s, this was not an an '80s experience for me. This wasn't even a '90s experience for me. This was a '2000s experience. This was me in like <laughs> 25 years old. Like, may, yeah, I wasn't in my 30s yet. But it's definitely in my like mid to late twenties, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I remember. I think it was something as simple as like I was IMDBing Catherine Mary Stewart because, I mean, we can get into this later. But I'm a massive fan, and I yes. it just sort of came up, and I remember seeking it out. I, I don't think I went. I didn't find it at a blockbuster or like a video store. I think I read about it, huh. and blind bought it. Oh, wow. Well, I bought the DVD, which I did bring out because the box is so goddamn ugly. But, <laughs> oh, my God. You know, the original poster, the poster doesn't sell the movie. It's like people and stars and like silhouettes. But uh, this was notorious in like the DVD community, especially, you know, for like bad video covers. Yes. It's not so much the cover art so much as the tagline that I find cringy, which is they came, they shopped, they saved the world. No, no, and no, no, no. I remember reading specifically like reviews that are like, ignore the fact that they sell this as like a Valley Girl comedy where like they shop. Because uh, <sighs> once you see the movie, like, yes, it, they are technically Valley Girls. And yes, at one point they do go shopping, but it's not a movie. Well, they shop lifted. <laughs> exactly, big difference. <laughs> yeah, if there's no one there to take your money, is it really shopping? Uh, <laughs> but yeah no that the movie was uh sold on dvd as something stupid uh and anyway uh i watched it i it was a great blind buy mm -hmm. uh i've only introduced it to a few people over time because uh i don't know i've introduced it to tracy and then yes there was a movie night where you were mm -hmm. introduced to it one of the more recent ones too because i i just saw mm -hmm. it i think either Last year? <laughs> I'm, th I'm guessing. I think it's further, it's further than that. Is it? Yes. Because remember, we watched Chopping Mall last year with okay. Kevin Baroni. But I, yeah. I mean, it's, I'd say maybe two or three years ago. Okay. Feels yeah. more recent. I mean, it was so fresh in my head while I was watching it, except for something we'll, we'll get to. Speaking, um, sorry. Yes. Speaking of fresh in your head, um, do you ever do a thing where like, you've seen a movie several times, but you always forget, oh, yeah, that happens in this? <laughs> um maybe the first it could be as much as the first five or six times after that it tends to stick yeah because no, i've watched this movie countless times but i still every time including this most recent watch i always forget the movie opens with an audio narration oh the, and the stars like, yeah and i'm like oh yeah i always just remember like people partying in the street and i'm like what i don't remember this oh wait i said that last time <laughs> <laughs> I think it sticks with me a little bit more just because it remi it reminded me again. So I guess I did. I mean, I've only seen it twice, but um, I remember that the first time I saw it, it reminded me of Little Shop of Horrors, the way yes. that movie opens, and it happened again. I think it's even because just hearing a voice say "existence," you know, <laughs> yeah, it's very the deep on the twenty first day of the month of September. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I appreciate that for for that absolutely. But um, no, uh, but I, I was so glad when you showed it to me because 
the way in was Catherine Mary Stewart, who I didn't mm. have like a vivid image of my mind. And then you said Winkin and Bernie. So I was like, oh yeah, because I haven't seen that in ages. But I, I was like, okay. So yeah, the girl in Weekend at Bernie's, totally cool. And then I think you had shown me already the apple. The apple was after. Was it? I'm pretty sure. I'm okay. pretty I'm pretty sure this is goes back at least three years. Like Okay. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I do. <laughs> but um, no, I do uh, remember like once I saw her, I was just kind of like, oh yeah, I really like her. Catherine Mary Stewart. There's something about, she's got that star quality that just makes you absolutely comfortable with her. Mm -hmm. She's totally easy on the eyes, but like also just inviting. There is just like an innate, <laughs> as he leans in, there is just an, like an innate goodness that just kind yes. of shines through her and that makes you want to spend an entire movie with her. And um, it made me actually like look at her again at her IMDb credits because I, I was wondering, I haven't seen her in anything for a while. What has she been doing? And um, the, she actually has a movie that's uh, waiting to be released. I don't know if it's, it doesn't look theatrical. It looks like it might belong on a Hallmark, mm -hmm. you know, holiday film. So it is Christmas oriented though. Oh. Um, and it's, yeah, it's called, uh, where did I put it? I wrote it down, I'll get to it later, but anyway, but yeah, oh, Deck the Heart. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Sounds great. And she is not on the poster, but she is the first uh, build, so I don't know what Ooh. that means either. So yeah, maybe Fox and Family or, you know, whatever. The whole um, channel. Yeah, or Lifetime. Lifetime, yeah, something like the ABC Family, is that what I'm thinking of? Yeah, yeah something or, like that. Or Christmas Time on Netflix, it's just all those types of movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there were a bunch of those that got uh, re recommended. And apparently she's done some of those as well. I don't know about Netflix, but more holiday films. So yeah. Well, the <laughs> since we're talking about her, let's just continue on that. Um, Please. You, there, There is a, like, you don't really hear this so much anymore, but like, kid, you've got it. You know, and yeah. there's something about, you can just put a camera on her and not only does, uh, she, tr uh, truth seems to come to her no matter what the scenario is. And I uh -huh. feel like um, she elevates whatever material she is just because of whatever presence she has. You know, there's certain mm -hmm. people that are really, you know, like, oh, we've got this part. It's of a guy that, at Bed Bath & Beyond, but you give it to Christopher Walken and all of a sudden it's like this memorable thing. It's, <laughs> there's these chinos and these Jeff Goldblums that have these cadences. And, and to me, even though she's not as an extreme personality as, as, as any of those, you, you give mm -hmm. her the material and uh, For yeah. example, The Last Starfighter, another movie I love and came out mm -hmm. the same year. Um, she is a standout character and performance in The Last Starfighter, even though on paper, I'm not saying it's a bad role, but it's, it does what it needs to do. But when right. you watch that movie, I remember as a kid, like she was just important to me as like Alex Rogan was in the movie. Like she leaves an impression on you in what could be a thankless role as the girlfriend. The girl, yeah. Right. Uh, she made the girlfriend more than just the girlfriend, yeah. simply by elevating the text. And um, this is definitely interesting because it's a, it's a lead role and it's, I'm really impressed for the most part that both the female characters don't feel terribly like the way female characters that are written by men feel. Yeah, particularly so, in this time period. Yes, there's moments for the 80s that they have between the two of them, the sisters just sort of talking and also just the fact that she wasn't written to be like overtly quote unquote girly, whatever, you know, your layman term for that. Yeah. Is. But you know, uh, she's a gamer. She's like competitive and petty about her score, you know, like uh, um, she still cares about her sister. And uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, Catherine Mary Stewart. Um, I first, I'll be honest with you, besides being like a good actress though, like she was one of my earliest crushes, like my childhood yeah. crushes. So uh, between Weekend at Bernie's and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the Last Starfighter, as a kid, I was like, hee hee. But as I got older, <laughs> homie's got talent, is all I'm saying. She carries the <laughs> fuck out of this movie. Yeah. Um, and, but also, um, another thing, uh, one thing that I was really enchanted to find out, because um, I don't own the uh, Scream Factory release yet, 
Um, so I watched it on Tubi, but I went to YouTube to see some of the, you know, uh, interviews that are on that disc that, have, you know, used to advertise it. And uh, just watching her talk about it. First of all, I mean, she still got it. Like, she's just sitting yeah. there in an interview, like, all these years later. And I'm just like, <sighs> you know. <laughs> she she <laughs> gives good interview. The, yeah, the Apple Blu-ray has a, just like a 45-minute just oh. blather into the camera. And it's, yeah. it's a good watch. It just makes me feel like I know her. Like, I, I feel like I could just, like, sit at lunch and just be kind of, and she'd just be cool, and I could just ask her whatever I want, and then I could just even maybe share something, and she'd probably be like, oh, that's really interesting. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, you're so cool. But uh, Here's how good but, she is. Yes. <laughs> She's even good in the apple. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's skill. That's another pod. <laughs> but, I'd be so down. So stay down. tuned, folks. Um, <laughs> big, both big fans. But uh, oh, spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no. Uh, one thing that I love that she brought up in this interview was uh, something that attracted her to to the role was, um, and I don't know if it's an outdated term, but she just used it to describe it. So she said like the tomboyish nature of that character, and um, and yeah, like you said, like the fact that she she and her together with uh, with her sister get to carry the movie. And she said, that was rare then, it's rare mm -hmm. now. So it was a real gift. Um, and I feel like it was something she, she saw nothing but opportunity in and was, had, had the talent and the skill and, um, and just the general kind of like decency as an actor to recognize all the opportunity that was there and appreciate mm -hmm. it. And to this day, she appreciates it. So that, again, like I said, I'm just sitting there watching her talk about this going like, oh, yeah, oh, you, yeah, you, you would have liked it that she was a tomboy. <laughs> That's really true. I feel like I turn into her in the last scene, like, you know, when she's all matronly and like, right. <laughs> so I feel like I adopt that watching her talk about this movie going, oh, that's so oh, good for you. Yeah, you're so sweet. I, oh, I love hearing you talk about these movies. But <laughs> I mean, and those, I, that, I'm just jumping, but those poor kids, you know, you, you survive this little apocalypse. You get taken to the facility. <laughs> you get saved. Your parents or your loved ones ever gone, and this girl is dressing you up in clothes and making you take like it's it's like I thought I escaped this. Yes. <laughs> and now I'm stuck but with her. She's making you wait to cross the street in right. a post-apocalyptic world. Um, in a post-apocalyptic yeah. DTLA still. They stayed. Yeah. I liked that. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> um, no, one, this movie's also aged well. I mean, aside from a few questionable lines, the movie's aged well mm -hmm. in that sense where I'm watching it going, oh, it's two female leads and they're not comedic buffoons. Right. You know, um, but they're more than just like the final girls. They are the lead roles. They, mm -hmm. And the third biggest role is a Hispanic character. Mm -hmm. Didn't see a lot of that in the 80s. Nope. Barely see it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, right on, movie. Like, cool. Yeah. Well, and then when they, that, when those two little kids, like one of the, one of the, the little girl, she's Asian. Yeah. And, and so it's like at the end of it, you've got like this family that is like not completely uh, 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 diverse, but for right. 1984, pretty damn diverse. Yeah. <laughs> like we're gonna repopulate the earth and it's not just gonna be a bunch of white people. Cool, things happen to, I mean, that was, I, I will embrace any film that features um, a kind of like, like world of the future or like, you know, end of the world as you and I know it now. And it's like, life will begin again and they include a, a, a Latino character. <laughs> right. They, we're, not, we're not always second or third or even fourth on the docket. So I'm just kind of like, oh good, a movie that says, yeah, you're gonna still be around uh, yeah. in the future. <laughs> we're gonna keep you around in the future. How about that? Uh, <laughs> but uh, I also love the fact that it, um, uh, okay, because this is both written and directed by Tom Eberhardt. Mm -hmm. um, who I also looked up, uh, who does have something that is in, uh, like, in production, which whatever that means right now, we're still in the midst right. of the pandemic as we record this, but uh, it's called Los Wildcats del Norte. And um, just to share with you, it's got one of the longest taglines. You want to talk about bad taglines? I wrote it all down. In a okay. place where change, here, listen, in a place where change doesn't come easy, 
the music would change their lives forever, period. Through a series of shared events, sometimes comic, sometimes tragic, they come to expect more from the music, more from life, and more from each other, period. That's the tagline. That's for... the tagline and not like <laughs> the pitch, like the log line. No, it was, uh, it was featured, again, it was on IMDb and they already made a mistake with the year of this movie, so maybe it's another mistake. The, but... <laughs> the Wildcats, for, in, for the English speaking people, the Wildcats of the North. <laughs> um, I'm guessing the Wildcats are a band? I, 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 if it's about the music, man, sure, why not? Um, he also directed Captain Ron, which I still have not seen. You've never seen I mean, <laughs> I've never seen that. It's not a classic, Ron. but I saw it in theaters. I laughed. I think I saw it one more time on VHS. Yeah, if, I, if it's streaming, I'll, I'll find it and I'll, I'll check it out. And also a, a show, a show uh, that I watched that nobody talks about anymore called Parker Lewis Can't Lose. He yes! Directed. Yes! Yes, bitch. It was like a serious okay, answer set, set to... Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, and it was, was like spark? a series answer to kind of Ferris Bueller's Day Off before Ferris Bueller's Day Off actually got its own its series own show. Yeah, in that bridge uh, in that show, between the eighties and the nineties. That show was not as good as Parker Lewis Can't Lose. No, Parker Lewis Can't Lose was awesome. That was an right. incredible show. It needs to yeah. be streaming somewhere. That was one of those shows yeah. where, um, like, the direction that was the star as well as your cast. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it had a definite flavor. You knew you were watching an episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. It had a total uh, style to it, yeah. I just watched Bloody Birthday for the first time last month. Oh, uh -huh. One of the three children in the movie is uh, Parker's friend. Not Kubiak, but the brunette, the white guy with the brown hair. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, um, shit, he's like the little brother in a bunch of He things. shows up in a lot. <laughs> But he, he worked is, throughout the 80s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I I'm literally watched the movie going, Parker Lewis can't lose. I mean, yeah. I, to this day, you s certain movies you go, hey, that's Coob. Like, yes. Anyway. He played a young John Goodman on uh, a flashback episode of Roseanne, and I remember thinking, oh. perfect! Uh, <laughs> he was a young Dan Connor, and I'm like, oh my God, I see it. Wow. How did I never see it before? Anyway. Yeah. I see it. Back to Night of the Comet. Back to Night of the Comet. <laughs> but um, no, I really uh, loved hearing about, oh, because like Tom Everhart, he's all over this movie. I mean, I don't know him, but according to Catherine Mary Stewart and to Kelly Maroney, he is. And he even incorporated himself as their father. Like there's that, you never see the father, but there are portraits uh, in the house oh, of yeah. like the family. And there's one lone photo in the background of, you know, like with a military, like a flag in the background and everything like that. And it is Tom Eberhardt in military garb, like posing. He wanted to be their father. Interesting. So, From what I understood, yeah. he's, he's also um, at the movie theater. He's, oh, really? I could have sworn in the commentary, because um, there's the guy in the front who's selling the antennas. But this is the uh -huh. guy that walks behind me and goes, oh, and there I am in the movie theater. Yeah. Mm. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, I... And I know it's his car that uh, she pulls up on the motorcycle and sees the empty car playing the Christmas music. Oh, okay. That's his car. So, oh, my God. He's, <laughs> so he's he is like, all over the movie. He, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm all over this movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You can, I mean, you also, can feel oh, it. Like, actually, and yeah. also, um, when, when uh, Hector goes home, Oh. And he's looking, the, picture, the pictures of the family are his family. Oh, really? Like, it's the director's family's pictures, yeah. Oh, my God, they look so Latino. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they are, but they pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, Hector, for sure, he's, um, he uh, identifies as, I did a little digging, and he identifies as uh, La Latindio because he's uh, part Mexican, and part uh, uh, indigenous American. Oh, okay. So yeah. Um, I like that word, Latindio. Yeah, I had never heard it before. I even thought like Latindio. Oh, Latindio. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll put that in my back pocket. Any yeah. Trekkies watching this won't kill me, but I'm like, I, when I like IMDb, I'm like, oh, he was in a Star Trek show. Okay, he was in Voyager. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think it's, it's funny, his, I think it's he, his bio, yeah. Doesn't he get photo top photo. billing? Does he? I In the opening see credits, there is. Oh. Uh, I'm pretty sure he gets top billing, and then Catherine Mary Stewart. And I remember this time going, 
Who the hell is getting top billing over Captain Mary Stewart? <laughs> and, Robert but obviously, Beltran. But obviously, Star Trek was years later. He was coming yes. off of eating Raul. So mm, literally, okay. I, think, I think he was Raul. So like at least at that point, maybe he gets okay. title treatment for that. Um, I guess. They saw him as an up-and-comer, maybe. Right. All right. Well, I mean, Captain Mary Stewart didn't you know, seem to care. So Captain Mary Stewart wasn't in eating Raul. She was... <laughs> <laughs> but she's like, bitch, I was in the apple. Which I think was like her I first feature. I think she feature. was. I don't think she was. Yeah, that was her first feature. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> no, um, Kelly Maroney also. If, uh, yeah. I just want to say, if I was Catherine Mary Stewart till the day I die, no shame whatsoever. I'd be like, bitch, I was in the apple. <laughs> If they make you wait for a table at a restaurant, you just be like, "I was in the apple." But um. Oh yeah, but uh, Kelly Kelly Maroney. I remember uh, the first time you showed me the movie. I saw her on screen. I was just kind of like, "Hey!" And you were like, "Yeah!" And I was <laughs> like, "I recognize." And I had to think about it for a while. And I think once I got in a little deep, she did something a little coquettish, and I remembered she was in Fast Times at mm -hmm. Richmond High. And I was like, also playing a cheerleader. Yes, I think that's what helped. <laughs> but, um, but um, like, because then later, of course, you showed me last year, you showed me Chopping Mall, which I love her in, which I was actually surprised that Tom Eberhardt didn't also write it or direct it because not only is Kelly Maroney also in it, but so is um, uh, Mary Waranov yep. as um, Audrey in this movie. She's like one of those little, yeah, like one of those little bidding awful people, like one of those bitches. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at, at the auction at the very beginning. Yeah, and the and, guy that's or whatever her, it is. They were both in Eating Raul together, so. Oh, really? Oh my is, gosh. So this is a chopping mall pre-reunion for her and Kelly Maroney, and it is a reunion for her and uh, Robert. Robert Beltran. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you go down the IMDb Google rabbit hole, you will see how incestuous uh, <laughs> this all becomes. Because the yeah, the, wow. guy she's, the guy she's with is an eating Raul, uh, and then years later, um, she's in. What is she in? She's in Devil's Rejects, and then the other doctor, the doctor who like gets sick early and has to wear the glasses. Uh -huh. Like the main bad doctor. He's oh also the Devil's gosh. Rejects. So Devil's Rejects becomes a reunion from this movie. Like everything kind of branches out. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Granted, they don't share screen time together in Devil's Rejects. Right. But they're both in that movie. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. And she's also she's also still working. She's got three upcoming projects. Yeah. I, I just works. have the titles. She did the video store, To Avenge, and Finding Nicole. So she's Kelly Maroney also, stands. There you go. She's in, She's also... not Kelly Maroney, uh, God, I just oh. her name. Uh, 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 Mary, War Mary Warrenoff? Yeah, Mary Warrenoff is in Everything I Love, basically. Yeah. She's in, she's in Shopping Mall. Yes. She's in Night of Comet. Yes. She's in Devil's Rejects. Uh-huh. Briefly, but um, she's in House of the Devil. Mm -hmm. uh, she's in, uh, and I love this, she's in fucking... Uh, Death Race 2000, and when when oh. Catherine Mary Stewart first leaves the movie theater, there's a Death Race 2000 poster on the door. Yes, like, I saw that. That's yeah. not an accident. Fucking Calamity <laughs> Jane. Calamity <laughs> Jane's in your fucking movie. That's um, amazing. Yeah, she goes way back to like, she's in a bunch of Roger Corman stuff. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I, yeah. Actually, what I know her most from uh, are two things. Uh, one that I grew up with, because uh, Shelley Duvall used to have that fairy tale theater, mm -hmm. uh, the fairy tales that she would put up. And she was in uh, one that many people probably haven't even heard of called The Princess Who Had Never Laughed, starring Ellen Barkin and Howie Mandel. And she played the stern governess, you know, with that voice and with that, you know, she's got, she's got a very angular face. Um, so she, I remember that was my first introduction to her, but my, I think my favorite thing I've ever seen her do, she plays the matron. Okay. In an episode, yeah, no, you're not going to get this one. <laughs> she plays the matron in a prison in an episode. It's probably one of the most famous episodes of the original Charlie's Angels 1970s TV show, where <laughs> I knew you where they that. where they where they pretend to be criminals so they get arrested to see if the prison really is corrupt, and then they end up being stripped, and she ho she sprays them for lice and everything, and and speaks to them in this very tough demeanor. 
And she even at one point she's speaking to one of the cops, one of the corrupt cops uh, who's male, and he's just kind of like, "Yeah, go on, get him, Max." And she just says in very deep voice, "Just Maxine," and she walks away. <laughs> so anyway, she played thought- a mannish woman on Charlie's Angels, which is all you know, an honor. But <laughs> I thought you were gonna say because my random thing I love her from, yeah, is um, institutionalized by suicidal tendencies. Oh! In the music video, she's the mom. Oh my God. And all I wanted was a Pepsi, and she wouldn't give it to me. Just one Pepsi. I'm like, <laughs> no, you got drugs. Yeah, like. <laughs> oh my oh. God. Yeah, she's been everywhere. And whenever, whenever it goes to the course of, it's a two slice, it's her lip syncing, it's a two slice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's all I want, you know. <laughs> Character actor resume. Right? What a fucking great career! If, I mean, I and know. it's lasted through the decades. She's been in TV. She's been Charlie's Angels. She's been fucking Suicidal Tendencies music video. Yeah. All these great '80s horror movies and stuff. But like to to get older and still be like Devil's Rejects, House of the Devil, and just mm-hmm. House of the Devil to be like you and Tom Noonan together. Like she's still yeah. like, really good parts. I mean, she is yes. creepy. And like, yes, <laughs> Adam's She's, family esque, like yeah, there's yeah. something yeah macabre. It's it's she wild did. that she wasn't in either of those movies. Maybe if I look deeper, I'll see <laughs> an uncredited yeah. role or something. But um, so anyway, anyway, it's fun so, to have her in this. Um, yes. Oh uh, my gosh. And she really, I her her like suicide scene, like she really does bring just okay. the right flavor. Of absolutely because of, of how it, much knowledge also how much knowledge she has over hector and and what she's willing to like let go but also like the not just the calm and the but the confidence <laughs> yes well she's wearing fucking sunglasses inside yep. in a what looks like it's supposed to be like well, a radio station but it looks like a club right <laughs> but and it, it, as yeah. as you start to deteriorate you know the harsher lights that's true that's yeah. true but um but i mean i didn't through. even i didn't even think of that i just kind of thought like <laughs> just thought she's too cool for cause, school because well, it didn't look like she had any like additional makeup like usually right. with them you can kind of see like the lines like the severe yeah. lines of cheekbones coming in what i call like the freddy tendons mm. and, and she didn't have that so i thought she was just yeah just kind of like you, you know what I'm a badass. I didn't kill Samantha. So, you know, and yeah. you're going to find out. You're going to miss me when I'm gone. So I'm going to go out like a total badass. Um, also, the fact that she's playing it perfectly because it is just enough heart and just enough uh, 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 to enough. get you interested. Yeah, like she's not throwing it away. But at the same time, she knows what movie she's in. It doesn't feel yeah. like a wrong note hit. Like we've already felt for both of the sisters. So the fact that we actually, and the fact that I'm interested in her, she's, she's exhibited some empathy for these children and gotten mm-hmm. into an argument. Granted, she's not a saint, but she's done what she could. I mean, she's jumping ship. She could have helped right. to throw it over, but I feel like she thinks she's too far gone. There's and only so rather... much she can do. Yeah. Exactly. But like, what I, I also mean, like, like too is in her first yeah. scene, you kind of think, well, these these this think tank of preppers who are who are planning for this could be could be good guys, and she comes off as kind of an asshole, right? And then as you start to realize their true intentions, they do a good job of making me dislike her at first, and then slowly yes. come around. Yeah, yeah I actually absolutely. feel bad for her when she's losing memory and she can't spell memory oh correctly. My God. And I also thought like that she's. Like she's acting it, but like we're the, the camera again. This is good filmmaking because, like, literally, there's a, a shot on a pen on a pad, and then mm-hmm. it cuts directly to her doing it, and it's seamless. I don't even know if that's her hand writing that. I thought about it while I was saw it because I went back uh. and watched it again, um, just because I wanted to watch the scene again. I was just kind of like, is there? A, can I look at her hand to like see if there's like you know polish on her fingernail to like resemble something? And I don't even know if that's her writing in the beat in the top and then her crossing it out most likely it's you know somebody else but um I, it, it just it just made me feel like i'm so involved like i'm she's so connected with that crossing out of memory in yeah. writing memory <laughs> that i just and i didn't doubt it for a second i was just like this is good i don't know how you do that so effortlessly um 
Yeah, I, 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 I uh, there's a uh, lot of I, smart decisions in here, considering uh, not like a judgment, but like I don't know how much of a how much this guy knew before he was making this movie, but yeah. like even just you know the, the the limited resources they have for that think tank facility. I mean, you can yeah. tell that parts of it are matte painting and miniatures and all that, but the sure. fact that, like they they use this angle a couple times looking down on the facility but they mm -hmm. always put this like shadowed soldier in the foreground and it gives you a really good sense of scale. It's very dramatic that there's like a patrol. Yeah. Down. Like a lot of other movies, you could just rely on the matte painting, but having that guy in the foreground, it's very Star Warsy, and it just gives me a greater sense of depth. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of little beats like that. Catherine Mary, I should actually start calling her uh, Regina. Regina, yes. first driving around to LA, you know, like- Oh God. It's just, it's just really good choices of how you sell without any dialogue it's one thing to leave the movie theater and go well where is everybody and then get attacked but once from when she first starts driving the through la to when she gets home she's a different person and they do a good job of communicating how she learns what the fuck is going on here yeah through no dialogue through just camera placement and like music and mm -hmm. timing and it's good stuff man also nice to see her atop like this Harley, or uh, not a Harley, I mean, I guess I'm just a motorbike, but, um, but just like driving around like the empty streets of DTLA, and it looks exactly like that still. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had a oh, delivery God. job like in the early AM, so I have seen the streets that bare. Yes. And um, th there's, just, there's just maybe more tent cities, unfortunately, uh, these days, but like the structures, and for, for, Los Angeles has this kind of uh, 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 reputation for not, and, and, and uh, the United States largely has a reputation for not keeping our history, for not preserving it, for tearing down our structures and rebuilding mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, streamlining things. And the, it's odd to see a movie shot in, I don't know, 82, 84, um, 83. Let's just <laughs> the split the difference and call it 83. Um, early 80s. Um, to see that there are things like some like streets like intersections on Beaudry and Third and Hope Street and whatnot that I could I'm sure I could drive down there right now and you know take a photo and it would probably look largely if not completely the same so that that's that's kind of heartening somebody who grew up in Los Angeles to go like oh my gosh I know where Beaudry is but uh <laughs> yeah I, I remember really being kind of taken aback by the uh just the initial shots and going, God, it really looks like LA. And then you see like the, a 101 on ramp by uh, that fucking bridge. <laughs> but like, I'm like, oh, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. There's the 101. Uh, I, I recognize <laughs> these buildings. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, so, one, I respect the fact that they actually shot in downtown LA because that's just impressive. I mean, especially for the shooting in LA is expensive. And I know they shot this in Raleigh Studios um, yeah. and in downtown LA. And I remember being thrilled when i saw this because uh the opening scenes in the el ray which mm -hmm. has been used in plenty of things including jay and silent bob strike back yes which <laughs> i was an extra for so yes, I remember, were. and so i'm seeing this maybe about four or five years after jay and silent bob strike back mm -hmm. and i remember thinking okay use the exterior but like do you shoot inside the oh that is the lobby you filmed mm -hmm. inside the el ray that is cool right <laughs> on this is actually a really good la movie i know a lot yes. of times uh if you want to talk about like good la movies you i always think of michael mann because he really shoots in like the meat mm. Mm. of like real la that you actual streets that i recognize i'm not like well this, sure. is, this is the la that movies film in and then like michael mann's like no no we're gonna get our fucking hands dirty here mm -hmm. um but this is very recognizable downtown la and yeah it's funny yes. right when our our, our lockdown lockdown started um if you want to call mm -hmm. it a complete lockdown but stay at home orders order and, yeah and businesses were closed mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine who lives in downtown la uh would go out in the afternoon with his camera and just take photos i'm like this is mm -hmm. nuts mm -hmm. this is so strange to me and even yeah. about two months ago i had to go pick something up and i went to downtown la and even though there were some people on the sidewalks, there were big parts of it, like even near like that, that Disney, the new Disney theater that's out there. And I'm yeah. Like, Man, this is just like, the, like there was no one out here. Yeah. Only when I passed by like a few hotels did I actually recognize that. So when I watch this movie now, the mm. idea of an empty downtown LA no longer feels weird to me. 
<laughs> just for a good chunk of this year, that's what it looked like. And they kind of ruined right. the mystique of like, well, we got up in the morning and held traffic and we got these shots and like, yes. All right. <laughs> To the best of their ability, like they didn't have the resources to really kind of shut down downtown LA entirely. So yeah, it was a lot of just like, let's station these people, you know, <laughs> at particular intersections and get in there and shoot it as quick as you can. Which, but to hear, if you hear Catherine uh, Mary Stewart and um, Kelly Maroney uh, talk about it, for them, it was a luxury, even though they only got like, they, you know, they had limited amount of takes that they could do, particularly on the streets and whatnot because they were both so familiar with uh, doing soap operas where you get one take, you're in, you're out, and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they actually got a second take sometimes <laughs> uh, was a luxury, because they're just kind of like, oh my God, I never get to do that. Because they were the both used to- The director addressed that too. Yeah. He was, he was saying like, if you're gonna cast the movies, like cast soap opera actors, because they're, they're used to working and like, they've always got their, their lines memorized, they're like ready to go, mm -hmm. this is the world they come from. So they are prepared. Mm -hmm. And especially I would argue for, that and just for real movie, actors, but yeah. Uh, right, but <laughs> true actors. Um, no, but uh, also th they had, uh, a, it was considered a small budget. So the director wanted to do as little takes as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, to yeah. for time and actual film, because actual film costs money. Um, yes. Like I remember, I, I, tell me if they'd talk about this in, that, in the Scream Factory bonus feature that Kelly Maroney, they were doing a fake slap with her mom and they weren't, She's like, I'm not, she's like, we're wasting, can you just slap me for real for this next tape? Just slap oh me for God. real. <laughs> okay, it, I'm like we got it, yeah. If they do, I didn't get to that part yet because I okay. didn't get to finish before we started shooting. But no, um, I didn't know about, I did want to talk about her though. I did want to talk about Doris because. Um, uh, every Okay, I've, I've watched this movie with people, other people twice and mm -hmm. both times. So <laughs> Doris slaps her. And then, God bless her, she slaps Doris back. Yes! And then and Doris then. reels back and punches her stepdaughter, teenage stepdaughter, mm -hmm. not only in the face, mm -hmm. hard enough to tumble over the couch and roll yep. feet to like, yeah. So um, when she dies, I'm, I'm fine with it. Oh, absolutely. She's also totally I'm... cheating on her husband, so uh, good reason. Yeah, search. but the funny thing is, like, even though, like, I think that's the first time we get introduced to Samantha uh, in that mm. phone call. Just, and, I, and you can tell that she doesn't have, like, a harmonious, like, drama-free relationship with, right. <laughs> with uh, Reggie. But, but you know, I can just get that, okay, they're sisters. But the way they both kind of like seem to sh be a, 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 a shared mind about Same Doris, wavelength. like they, yeah. they know who she is. I'm immediately like, oh, I don't think I like this person. Right. And then to watch the way she's talking to her uh, on the phone and everything like that, trying to tell her like, you know, she, I don't even remember the exact lines, but just like, the, just that exchange, I'm getting everything I need to know. And the more I see <laughs> Samantha, the more I'm like, Oh, I really like you. And that, yeah, yeah, so then finally when she gets slapped and then she's slapped back, I'm just like, yes! And then when she gets punched, I mean, and also like she talks about how she makes, a, she uh, loosened a tooth. Yeah, she mentioned. Uh, the next morning. Yeah. And, um, and then she's talking about like their dad and like, what's he going to think about it? And like, he seems like he's not exactly like, you know, a bowl of cherries himself either. Right. Um, because about like how upset he's going to get about the fact that like, oh, well, they can't afford to have good dental work, you know, like, or to have her teeth worked on and shit like that. And I'm like, <laughs> what? What house are you living in? <laughs> this is a horrible, horrible parenting that's going on. If you guys can talk, be this blasé, talking about, like, this abuse that you're suffering at the hands of your stepmother. If well, ever there was a wicked... Uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> no, no, we'll come, uh, just remind me to come back to what I consider all the little, the little wit sprinkled through that movie, that's part of it. <laughs> oh yeah absolutely but um no so i mean i'm i'm really glad that we didn't have to spend any more time with doris uh than we did um who by the way it, that yeah. that actress is the mother in real life of the little boy from the end oh really yeah oh that's funny oh my gosh okay <laughs> it is incestuous it but, is. <laughs> <laughs> cinematically cinematically yeah but um no that's awesome um you know she does a really really good job because she makes she, she makes me hate her like that and i mean and hate and really hate her like really 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 hate her um but oh i also i think the first thing that made me love samantha is the fact that like when she's on the phone and uh, Reggie's telling her to like go uh, 
basically like to, you know give her an excuse for why she can't be there mm -hmm. she just does that eye cross thing and just kind of like okay no. <laughs> she no, says no. the line that you were born with an asshole doris you don't need chuck <laughs> before the slap <laughs> that line. line is gold i remember uh, that would have been what something that i would have watched as a kid and wondered when in my life am i going to get to do say, i get to use that yeah am i going to get to say that to somebody at some point in my life because that's that's too great a line what were some of your great little things um <laughs> great little things uh <laughs> well no i was actually the eye roll is uh it's not an what well, no it's not an eye roll what i love is when she's like okay and she like goes okay as she's getting up and she <laughs> So many other actors, I feel like, would do an eye roll. She mm. does like this little cross-eyed thing, like, yes, mm, yes. and it fucking <laughs> kills me. Um, yes. <laughs> no, a little. Uh, to me, it's a funny line. Like, she like my tooth. This, you know, for like how my dad said, like, our dental plan. You have to be careful because your dental plan doesn't cover cosmetic surgery. I like that the <laughs> dad would just tell his daughter that. Ten, <laughs> you know, dental plan's not for that. There's a lot of little things that I'm like, what kind of father do you have where that's something yes. that gets shared? <laughs> um, I actually wrote a bunch of lines down that, that cracked me. There's one, I, I can't oh, me too. Exactly. There's a bunch of just, I, 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 this movie does, does this a lot and I'm, and I'm okay with it, which is when someone says, either someone says something and then the person kind of goes, reacts like this, like their next line. Right? Or when someone says something and then their next line, they just sort of undercut themselves. Um, like at one point, I, I don't remember when, it's the only one I didn't write down where um, Samantha is like, oh, I was just thinking. And then like, Reggie's like, well, like, don't start doing that. For the, like, there's some, one of those that are like, okay. for, you know, one of the, for the first time kind of follow-ups, but. Um, right, right. Uh, when they walk in the radio station, and they're like talking about like, do you think this is what's going on like in Burbank? She's like, I don't know, maybe the DJ knows, right? Like, he 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 says the news, doesn't he? And then you just hear hear <laughs> Samantha go, "Search me." I always change the channel when the news comes on. Like, <laughs> it's not a full <laughs> joke, but it's a funny line, and it educates me about who she is because they don't yes. make her they don't make her into a total ditz, mm -hmm. but she isn't the smartest girl in the world. And I like no. the little things like, yeah, I don't fucking change the channel. Like when I was her age, <laughs> I didn't change the I wouldn't want to either. Um, right. <laughs> just, just like little witticisms um, mm -hmm. and absurdisms. Like just as absurd as like, you remember dad's always saying that we can't have cosmetic surgery on our teeth. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're <been> always saying. <laughs> That is yeah. an abomination. Just as absurd, just as absurd, and I fucking love it, is they're going to gas the kids. Oh, God, yeah. And they tell them, like, you know, you're going to go meet Santa Claus. Yes. They cut to Regina coming into the door, and as she's getting to the door, you get to come back to their conversation, mm -hmm. and the kids are like, I don't know. My parents always told us to never breathe anything from strangers. <laughs> yes. Typically, we're told not to talk to or take anything from, but never yes. breathe anything from strangers. Right. <laughs> the kid says with a straight face. And I love that that's a line that was written. I don't think the kid's young enough to be funny about things. And I like to yeah. imagine parents going like, if strangers ever come up to you with something to breathe, what do you say? Don't no. <laughs> don't you breathe other people's things. Hey, Katie, you want to bring this paper bag? No. Yeah. <laughs> that's an aerosol can. No. Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> there's, there's so much. Uh, through, like, the movie, uh, to me, works because of the two leads, the story, and the direction and vibe. But mm -hmm. more than that, just throughout, there's all this, there's a little salt in the soup. Like, um, you know, the, I forget the guy's name that, that uh, Reggie bangs in the beginning. But he's on the oh, phone. Oh, me too. He's on the yeah. phone saying, $100? You know, I'm going to have to stay here for that. That's right, 110 That's better. <laughs> 110 G Gives you a rough idea. <laughs> Little things that you don't need to write. The one, I think my number one with the bullet is the reporter going, well, the first country that's going to encounter it is Newfoundland or Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, both yes. are wrong. They're both <laughs> the incorrect pronunciation. <laughs> oh but my the gosh. Fact that you took the time to write that 
and shoot that in what otherwise would just be an expository line from a fucking newscaster. Yeah. But the yeah. fact that they had, someone had like a a Newfoundland issue and like I want to put that on the fucking script. <laughs> Can um, I also piggyback off of like you uh, establishing like uh, lines that just kind of give us who they are? Mine isn't even a line; it's a reaction. It's when they first meet Hector, and uh, they and they ask him. Uh, I don't remember what they ask him if he has a car or something like that. And he's just like, "No, I drive a truck." And Samantha just makes this ick face, like it's so <laughs> small, but she's just kind of like, "Oh, chat. Oh, that's gross." <laughs> like I thought you were cute, but I'm over it now. I fucking love that. <laughs> And to me, that that's I don't listen to the news. I change the station. Like, yeah, <laughs> these little itty bitty things. Um, same thing with when like the gun jams, and she's just like, I mean, see, that's the thing is, if Dad got this, would have been an Uzi, and that's improv. Yes, I knew about which, that. I just found out. Watching also, it, yeah. really makes that character feel so <laughs> fleshed out because again, like they they knew like, oh, it jammed. Just keep going because we can only shoot like one or two takes. Uh, yeah, because they also, well, because they had already shot a bunch of them and the Uzis, the one, not the Uzis, but whatever they had kept sticking. Yeah. And they kept saying like, oh, God, okay, start up from one. <laughs> and uh, so that's why she said, he said, just, just say you, you have a problem. Just talk about your dad. She's like, oh, all right. Uh, Catherine Mary Stewart said that was one of the few moments that was actually improv in the entire movie. Yeah. But yeah, I just, I just, I yeah. wrote it down before I knew that just because I love that moment so much because yeah. again, it speaks about their history. Her just saying, see, this is the problem with these things. Daddy would have gotten us Uzis. <laughs> and the fact that they were both raised by like an army guy like yeah he would which take also them down, like to practice shooting at the at the uh, uh army base and everything which oh yeah. and i love that they mentioned the los alamitos base because i grew up by the los alamitos base so not only is the movie downtown la which honestly isn't very far from me right now um, yeah but i grew up near the los alamitos base and they talk about like how much weapons are there and like it's true like that was always a joke because they have these big like um the silos that are like kind of built into the ground and you see like the lump and then the lump leads into, yes like, and the joke was always like man if anyone ever like if they ever bombed like los alamitos like because <laughs> there, there's so many like missiles and things stored there <laughs> oh my god um no that's amazing yeah. that yeah I, I i love that moment and and also i like the idea that um with, without like they don't have like a big monologue about my dad trained me to do this and that, and blah, blah, blah. but just like no, these these girls can take care of themselves. Yeah, they were raised by this guy, and and now we, you know, if you, if you were the type of guy who goes, these girls are gonna, you know, like, well, no, here's a reason why. Right. Um, yeah. And you don't have to be a superhero to be able to take care of yourself to handle no. yourself. I mean, they they actually do get incapacitated at one point, and I'm sitting there going like, oh no, how are they gonna get out of this when they're in the mall with the fucking stock boys, which. Yeah. As, as a former stock associate, I, I take umbrage with uh, their... <laughs> oh, we'll get to them um, in a moment. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate that she, when she's fighting that like zombie hobo in the alley, she doesn't do that thing a lot of 80s movies did where they're like, hey, don't mess with me. I know karate or something. She just goes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I know how to take care of myself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nice. She's not even bragging. Um, she's just informing that like, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no fool here. Yeah, and she, she kicks his ass until he throws her into some garbage. But she's, yeah, she handles herself, I think, better than I would. Face-to-face <laughs> <laughs> -face with a zombie, I'd be like, you get, okay, I'm sorry. We, 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 we got into this a bit with Return of the Living Dead. And you know how I like my zombies uh, as, as an audience member and as a, as a, participant in the imaginary mm. kind of like, oh, plug myself into this scenario. You like them to not be too lucid and talky. I, he said shit to her. Mm -hmm. No, no, <laughs> you are not allowed to get in my head. You are not allowed to have like the presence of mind to lift me and throw me into something to incapacitate me, to make me, you know, like, like, oh, I'm wounded and now I, or I've sprained my wrist and now it's harder to fight you. No, you are lolling and uh, maybe you can say brains and that's it. But no, you fucking zombies. I'm, I swear to God, if we ever have a zombie apocalypse and they can talk or run or fight me, I'm going to be pissed. I'm probably, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be angry. I might be a real, I don't know, maybe I'll be able to take some of them out just out of pure rage because it's injustice. I don't, I don't agree with it. I, I hate it. I'm so incensed. I just wanted to say that. 
that you should not be allowed <laughs> to get inside my head with your fucking, you know, like, it, like oh, I mean, it's, it's pissing it's, me off. It's interesting because this is doesn't often get discussed as zombie movie. And granted, there's a yeah. lot else going on, but and and yeah. you know the zombies in this are a product of well, the majority of the world gets turned into dust. A few people don't because they're in steel lined spaces, and then there's a percentage yeah. that, for whatever reason, don't turn into dust right away. It's a more gradual process. You lose certain <laughs> memory functions, then you eventually become a zombie, and then and within a few more days, then you'll turn to dust anyway. Right, Which is right. interesting because in theory, as long as you can survive the next few days, those zombies will turn to dust too. <laughs> we, we never get there. But it is right. explained to us. But yeah, no, every once in a while, someone will mention this as a zombie movie. And I'm like, good for you. Because it is. It's yeah. Not, well, it's a movie that happens to have some zombies in it. Yes, yes, yes. Not the a chief, full zombie movie. Well, but also in the vein of like what keeps me from the genre so often or the subgenre so often is that most of the uh, uh, antithesis they, they, they encounter is from people, like lucid, actual human beings. That's what keeps me away from most zombie <laughs> movies. But most of them don't have this heartwarming, you know, like, like bond between like two sisters and a guy they meet who, yeah. uh, you know, who's Latino, <laughs> who, who gets to live and they get to raise, you know, kids yeah. and, 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 and live happily. I mean, is she even... Samantha even gets to meet a guy at the end and it's a significant guy. Mm -hmm. But, um, but uh, no, I, 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 I can appreciate, I, I don't know if there's anything about this movie I don't appreciate. It's interesting that you're speaking of zombies still. Yeah. I, I just clicked right now how much 28 Days Later is like the really serious version of this movie. Oh my God. And that he wakes up and he wanders an abandoned London. Right. And then like the third act of the movie is like a, like an armed facility of like soldiers, you know, right. they have a they have a devious intent. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, if it had been more like Night of the Comet, I would have liked that movie better. I need oh, to see I, it again. I, I like I, that movie. I haven't seen it in like 15 years. I have to see it again. And I never saw the sequel. But um, of, it goes on the list of pretty good sequels. Oh, good. Okay. I'll, I'll give it a chance again. Um, and also, it's the kind of sequel, just side note, that uh, yes. it's, one of the, it's one of those movies This happens every once in a while. You look at Days Confused and go, if we wanted to get that, this exact cast now, it would cost so much more. When, right, you look right, right. At, when you look at 28 Weeks Later and you're like, Imogen Poots and like Jeremy Renner, like, mm. I think that was like my <laughs> first Jeremy Renner. Like it is. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it's a pretty, yeah. Uh, Robert Carlyle, it's a hell of a cast, all things considered. My first Jeremy Renner was an episode of Angel, but that actually brings me to another thing that I liked when she was fighting was the fact that um, uh, uh, Regina uh, grabbed a plank of wood and I immediately was like, oh, Buffy, planting the seeds for Buffy! Uh, uh, fun <laughs> trivia, Joss yeah. Whedon claims that this movie in was inspired the, buff the Buffy screenplay. I love that. And you I can love see it. That. You can yeah. see it when you watch this, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, God, oh, the sense of humor and the pathos and then, like, yeah, the actual threat. The fact, because the fact is, like, when they actually do come toe-to-toe -to -toe with something, I am scared for them. I am, mm -hmm. I, 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 I do want to see them succeed because the, the heavies in this movie, the, even though they're not all really kind of long for this world, <laughs> um, they, I don't, I, I don't, I don't like them. Like, it starts with Doris. <laughs> and then it goes to the stock boys. And actually, then it goes into that first zombie that we meet, who actually, oh, I also, uh, we were talking about the posters earlier. One of the posters I really appreciated, I'm not sure I noticed it the first time around, but it was red dust, red dust. on the door. <laughs> yep. <laughs> After we've already seen everybody, like, on the streets, like, turning into red dust, and I was like, oh, it's actually more uh, of a burnt sienna, but good for you, I see you, movie. <laughs> there's, there's, as far as I can tell, three noteworthy sort of gag posters. One is Red Dust is the most jokey. Yeah. Then Death Race 2000, because you've got yeah. a cast member from it. And also, uh, behind the concession poster is a Valley Girl poster. And also, one of the records is the Valley Girl soundtrack at the DJ. Uh, he wrote the script inspired by Valley Girl because Valley Girl was such a hit. And he's like, what if Valley Girls in the apocalypse? But also, oh. the distributors of this movie distributed Valley Girl. And the two producers... Where the filmmaker, like they made Valley Girl, and like their big, 
their in their partnership with that uh, I don't want to call it a studio but production company mm. was like cool what's our like you think the clout would be we get to write and direct our next movie and they're like no you're gonna produce this script and they're like oh okay but there's so much Valley Girl this movie exists in so many ways because of Valley Girl so I think it's nice funny. the posters in the background not to mention an Escape from New York uh, Tommy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I saw that. and my favorite For Forbidden Zone. Is yes, that. I noticed that too. Also, in the one thing that I wondered if it, if he's just a fan, um, because when they were inside of the uh, projection room. Uh, there were two Marlon Brando uh, posters. Mm. There was one for On the Waterfront and one for The Wild One. And I was just kind of like, oh, I wonder if that's significant. That's when I started paying attention to all of them. And I, yeah, I wrote yeah. down all the titles you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, because Forbidden Zone and Tommy stood out to me because I'm like, well, they're kind of like absurd and about like, you know, like journeys, like, you know, beyond yeah, what I you know, think... to like challenge yourself and actually kind of like come out on top, you know, like actually be better for going through this, you know, potentially traumatic and you know uh uh I'll, 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 I'll hurdle crossing almost like a a personal olympics you have to go through and, and so and, i thought that was pretty cool and, and even though there is a connection that you've just made i i just think the that valley girl and the other two are the only ones that had intent and the rest were just like hey here's some fun movies yeah maybe <laughs> just like <laughs> what other posters do we have yeah <laughs> But, um, but, I, but it didn't make me appreciate it any less. Also, as far as like locations um, and recognizing them like in a personal way, because I was raised in uh, Chatsworth, which is adjacent to the, you know, E.T.'s neighborhood, they live, it looks like E.T.'s neighborhood or the Poltergeist neighborhood where, uh, yeah, yeah, like when, yeah. all, when they wake up the next morning and you just see that street, I'm just like, oh my God. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw like, you know, men in like astronaut suits, like, you know, like in a white van. Right. Driving with a long... Totally, totally. Like when you that. see the the street, yeah, yeah, and even even the shot of like the entryway, like when um, Samantha notices that the dog leash is there, but where's yeah. where's the dog? <laughs> and and, um, and the way the light is coming in and everything like that, I'm just like waiting for us, like you know, a spaceman to like you know like wander through right. and for her to scream, yeah. "This is my home." Or anyway. like Twilight Zone, like where are all the people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Where'd everybody go? <laughs> That sounded very Nicolas Cage of you. <laughs> <laughs> Where are all the people? <laughs> anyway, sorry. I also love that. I, I, I it's, it just reminded me of when, when, cause she's literally screaming, like, it's Saturday. Where are all the kids? Yeah. And I like that Samantha like figures it out. Yeah. And then once that like realization sets in, she like just sort of, closes the door and he's like, oh. like that's such a more true choice than like any kind of movie sort of reaction that and it's and i love that it's not what the fuck like no. if regina doesn't like the next scene is still done just talking about her just like taking that moment and i need to go inside and fucking it is safe in here what's out there is the truth and i don't like that yeah, it's shock, and then it also yep. back like backs up on her later. I love. Oh god, well, let's, I love let's, it so let's, much. Let's talk about her and shock because we haven't really done her justice yet. Yes, go please on. go on. No, um, okay, no, I mean because um, uh, I have uh, a favorite uh, scene, and I'm curious if that's what you're about to say. Well, but no, no, then just go, please. They're <laughs> they're hanging out. Um, I think at this point they're hanging out in the, in the cop car, and she's recounting i think they're talking about how like you know there's no there's no guys and she's like there's this one guy from this other school he's kind of a dork but you know and yeah, she, yeah and then she i'm gonna just make up a name but she's like and then sally said he liked me and then she's like she recounts how like sally was like flunking a thing and didn't want to tell her parents and the fact that she started to recall someone and then realized that they're dead yeah. and she instantly like gets hit with the truth of because the only time in the movie it's a pretty fun little movie about everyone's dead but yeah, and it's I like it. And if you are gonna get, get to the meat of it, you can. I'll give you a scene, but don't bum me out, man. But she's, I'm gonna use the word brilliant. It's a brilliant, yeah, fucking performance in this take where like you see all that, and I think we've all been there at some point, mm -hmm. recalling either something tragic or something that you lost and in the moment you weren't ready to talk about it, but the second you mention that person's name or something, you just get consumed by it. And she gets consumed by it, but then she also fights her way through it. Mm -hmm. And you see the, like, the toll, that, oh, it's fucking, that scene is everything to me.
I, I concur. Everything you said, absolutely. I, I, I think the the what makes it so great is the fact that it it feels like a gradual realization, which is hard to play. You know, you have to actually allow for spontaneous things to happen and for, you know, for a release and for a catharsis. I mean, a lot of actors can cry, but the fact that I'm so with her, I know where she's going and I want her to go there. Like I'm almost as her friend. I'm like, okay, good. This is good. You have to realize this. You have to get it out so you can, you know, and we need to take this moment to pause so you can go on because you have to survive. You have to have right. those moments when you're in these kind of dire circumstances and you've lost everyone and everything. You aren't going to be able to take it all in at once. I like the, I, I, like you said, uh, I like the fact that they didn't go, there were so many awful routes they could have gone with the way particularly Samantha deals with that uh, immediate reality mm -hmm. <laughs> dawning on her. Um, like they're, the, uh, the, the most, the most uh, I think, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, tedious is denial. Right. <laughs> but even though it's not an outright denial, it's not like an outright acceptance either. It's just kind of like, uh, I'm going to carry this to the kitchen with me and go to my cereal because that's all I can deal with right now. Mm -hmm. And then, and then finally, like, yeah, just by talking about like these people, like this one guy, I mean, it was kind of related because she kind of had her eye on, um, uh, I already forgot his name. Um, Ro Robert Beltran. Oh. Yeah, Hector, sorry. Yeah. On, and they call him Heck. On Heck's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Get her eye on Heck for a while. Uh, and even wanted a shot at him when they, when right. they airlift <laughs> um, <laughs> Regina out. But um, so the fact that she's starting to think, like, well, there was a guy who I had my eye on. He was in every school. So, I mean, whatever. But he was nice and everything. And even that had me. Like, that yeah. already... Oh, um, I love how yeah, as, well defined yeah. she is. Yeah. Again, I, like they don't make her the two dimensional stupid sister. No, and they really she's humanize her. She's just, right. She's just a kid. Um, and, it, it, and technically, the, yeah, they yeah. both are right because uh, yeah. because Regina's talking about going to this trip for her she, her yeah. lie about for a class. So I have to presume she's a senior. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always considered Samantha to be maybe a sophomore because she's talking mm. about like she wasn't like she wasn't talking to the juniors or something. I don't know. But mm. enough so that I do wonder. I, I hope Re Regina's 18. because She has a job, but I'm just concerned. She says about, she's 18. OK, good. I don't remember. But good, because Hector is a trucker, so he's more of an adult. And I'm like, just concerned about you fucking with a high schooler here. Mm. <laughs> but if she's graduating she's soon and she's 18, I don't feel icked out. But still. Right. She shrieks that she's 18 when she's on the phone with Doris. That's right. Yeah. B before the, the, oh, and it's after the eye cross. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it's after the eye thing because she talks to her directly. Yeah. Yeah. But, no. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and has nothing to do with her performance, but I love that scene um, because in a, in a lesser person's hand, or if, the, or if this DVD covers to be believed, if you are going to have a scene where they go shopping, it's not a case mm. of, well, the world's over. What should we do? Let's go shopping. But it becomes right. a thing where, like, I need to cheer my sister up. Exactly. And all, all it, the malls, all the stores, it, oh, she said, I even wrote down the way she said it. The stars are uh, open. open. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought she said the stars when she first said it. <laughs> I still kind of hear stars, and I have to remember, so I know it's stores. <laughs> but the stars <laughs> are open. Like, you know. Some old Hollywood thing, but I mean, again, like, and we're, again, we've got a, a, a feature with zombies in it that puts people in a mall, uh, but this is not Dawn of the Dead, and this is, uh, or a, a horror movie that takes place in a mall, like a chopping mall. I thought, like, oh, chopping mall, again, like, here, I've, no wonder I'm kind of blurring the line and thinking, like, oh, there are people in both of them, but they're two separate movies. Oh, and my Kelly brain Maroney is, is very likable in both of them, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the fact that um, the biggest vibe I get when they're doing their girls just want to have fun, not vocal with no vocals no. by Cindy Lauper, um, yeah. but still with the song, so good on them. Yeah. But, uh, and they're all dancing around. The strongest 80s in a mall vibe I get is a similar music sequence that happens in another one of my favorites, not a horror movie, but Mannequin, when yeah. just Kim Cattrall and Andrew McCarthy are dancing around in all their different clothes and everything. And I'm like, 
see, ah, well, I don't know what it is, but if I ever, I've been in malls overnight, but, you know, doing inventory. And unfortunately, there was no <laughs> dancing. There was no, like, right. I brought my friend, we're going to, or my lover, we're going to, you know, let's, let's, let's let our imaginations go wild. And I still want it to happen. It's still, I still want to be in that movie. Hey, but, <laughs> uh, like, if working at Target meant I got to roller skate with uh, Jennifer Connelly when the store Right. Comes, <laughs> yeah, sign me up, man. Sounds great. But I know that's not how it is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the fact that, um, oh, the, uh, even the fact that, like, when it, their musical number is cut short, yeah. by um the fucking uh stock boys yeah there's, I, I i love the fact that there's something that keys into my little boy heart when i watch the sequence where they're defending themselves because i always loved it when women could defend themselves in yeah. movies and tv but i also love the fact that because i was a huge mannequin fan as a kid um i loved just watching her watching Catherine mary stewart pretend to be a pretend mannequin, be mannequin as a diversion I it's mm -hmm. so so good. Eighties. <laughs> yes, I, I can put it. It's I love brilliant. that. I want to like, do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 my my natural reaction is is it, it actually pulls me out of the movie, but in a good way to be like, we're gonna do a mannequin fake out. <laughs> we did a mannequin fake out. <laughs> you know, and it worked. It, no, like it so both works. Jumped, and I, and also, yeah, and I believe that those guys wouldn't notice like if she yeah. got there at the right time. Not only do I love the mannequin fake out, it delivers exactly what it's supposed to deliver. But on a personal, like a more, uh, I, I adore that um, that Samantha starts throwing shoes, even though yes. they are an inadequate weapon and will do nothing except maybe like poke them in the head a little bit from that mm -hmm. distance. And they're not heavy boots or anything, so they're not doing much damage. Yeah. I love that she tries. Like her instant reaction is, what the fuck do I have around me? She doesn't yes. cower, she doesn't no. flee, she mm -hmm. goes into action ill-equipped as she is she still mm -hmm. makes the choice to go into action but what's even better is she throws shoes they shoot at her she ducks yes stop shooting she gets back up and does it more yeah like, even being shot at doesn't scare her off she just yeah. throws more shoes I <laughs> love her also because there's this subliminal layer where She's you know smoke. that that each one of you get the sense that each one of them knows that there's the other one has their back, you mm -hmm. know, like they're a, they're a team, and without any words being spoken and without any one sister coaching the other, they just kind of do the best they can. Well, I think my favorite Samantha moment in that moment. I, I'm glad you brought all that up because I think the topper on uh, thing on top of all of that, just before like she gets apprehended, is um, when she comes face to face with one of them on the stairs, and she's just like. Hi, and knees him in the balls. <laughs> and then does like a little like tee hee hee, like girly jump. Yeah, I know. Like, but I'm still a high school girl, you know. Exactly. And it's, it's like, it's okay, almost, it's stupid, almost a Bugs Bunny moment. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not stupid, but I'm also not just going to stand there and just be like, ah, ah, you know, I mean, right. she's not going <laughs> to. She immediately defends gonna, herself and attacks him. She's, yeah, she's not going to pull a Judy. Uh, again, I love Night of the Demons, but she's not going to like pull a Judy and fall down and be like, get up, Judy, I can't. Uh, no, yeah, these no, shoes. <laughs> they got final girl energy. And yeah. That they both deserve. Deserve. And I pray for them to be alive at the end of this movie. Okay. 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 I am <laughs> jumping a little ahead, but it's okay. topical. <sighs> Because one thing I did forget, well, actually, okay, three things I forgot in this movie. I forgot the two Samantha dreams. Uh huh. <laughs> the first one started, and I was just kind of like, wait, did I forget this part of the movie? I don't ever remember her in that dress. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, I mean, I, I kind of, but I don't remember how it gets resolved. Did they already go to the mall? Oh my God, did right. I zone out? Like, you know, I'm in the way. And then finally she wakes up, and I'm like, Oh my God. Okay. Thank God. Because I also, I was really bothered, but I think it works for the movie, but I was really bothered by the hands through the driver's side window, reaching for her legs and stuff right. like that. And she's in a skirt and I'm just like, Oh, horrible it, things. It cause... doesn't fully commit to like what you think it would do, but it's, it's enough to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a threat and it's not, I don't yeah. like it. And the fact that she wakes up, I'm just going to like, makes a little more sense to me now too. Um, <laughs> but 
then I forgot that when she wakes up, she doesn't really wake up. She's mm-hmm. still in a dream. And a cop comes in while she is in her bra and panties and starts all over. And then she wakes up screaming even louder. And, and that like, scream is... Yeah, that is a blood-curdling, yeah. awful... That's like a Nightmare on Elm Street <laughs> scream. <Yeah. laughs> Waking up out of your nightmare. And um, so those were two things that I forgot that I was grateful that I got to experience again, like, as if I were a first-time viewer. Don't, don't you but love that? The, but the thing that I forgot, because I'm like, I, do, I feel like she's not dead, but I don't remember how that gets resolved either. <laughs> I don't entirely believe that um uh 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 uh, what's her name audrey Uh, white audrey Mm -hmm. that audrey would kill her off like she could have injected anything but i I wasn't even i'm so in the movie that i'm not even thinking that far ahead so i'm just kind of like i don't know what to make of this okay i'm sad though i'm sad because if i forgot this i'm an asshole because this is a major loss and i feel like i would have i should have remembered that samantha dies and then the fact that like she gets and the trunk opens, and there's Hector going, just like, and that's like she's dead. And just kind of like, oh, no, she's not dead. It's it. And he explains it all, like, in, like, a line that, you know, yeah. it was, like, something else that she gave her. Like, it wasn't I saw for Bill. I'm just using that on everything because we're in the middle of a pandemic. But he, he injected something else in her. <laughs> she injected second something else in her. seeing it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just my second I, time. I, I literally had the exact same experience my second time with okay. her two dream sequences where I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't. She's drinking in the car. I don't remember this. Yeah. I thought, does she go back to the radio station? Yeah, I had the exact same experience. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Except, but yeah, I mean, maybe it's because I've seen it a few times, but I mean, I, I, just, I feel like even just based on who the character is and like the, 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 the basic structure of writing when she's giving her the injection, I'm like, you're putting her to sleep. We're going to pretend she's dead. <laughs> I, I didn't like, entirely me, know this. It's not a fake yeah. out with the trunk. Although, although it's... <laughs> when I saw her, though, I was just kind of like, how morbid to drive with her, like, you know, like, yeah. if she were dead, Hector's got some new issues that we haven't brought up yet. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, I just loved um, the fact that she, yeah, that she got to survive because, because also they're right back where they were, you know, like with that cadence and that exchange that they had in that very first phone call where we get introduced to the, to um, uh, Samantha and to Regina. Um, oh, when they run, you know, right, right, where she's like, I thought you were dead. Yeah, no, I'm not dead. <laughs> um, and um, so, so uh, um, but okay, but the thing is, the premise, like even just like the thought of her being killed off like just what even just watching her like go to sleep and the questions she's asking and how hopeful she is and everything right it's so fucking sad it's and and she as an actress is selling and making that moment work both of them are yeah. because like i get i buy that she trusts yes. audrey and even though she's like, there's still little moments, little lingering moments where she's just kind of like asking for reassurance. Like, well, isn't, mm-hmm. I don't know what the exact lines are, but where she's just kind of like searching, like, that's not like this though, is it? And she's like, no, it's not like that. And I'm just kind of like, oh, okay. And I'm like, yeah, it is easier to feel safe, isn't it? Right. I, I'm like right there with her. So yeah, I, I sometimes, Samantha, this, I, this, I this time I her. wondered, cause I'm like, I never believed for a moment that she would die, but I'm like, I wonder if this would ever be the movie where the tone would make me question and like I never question that she's gonna die. Mm. <laughs> but what if? What if the movie took that turn? I watched a movie yeah. recently that um, I won't say the name in case anyone's out there is watching because this would spoil it. But a somewhat newer movie uh, that's sort of a horror movie. It's more of a thriller, but it, it features kids and characters that like. I'm like, yeah, but you would never like really like kill them off or do anything tragic. To, and then like the last ten minutes is like, fuck you, we're gonna do some things. And I'm like, movie, I did not expect you to do this. Oh Holy wow! Shit. And I never feel that way about this. I, mean, I don't think it's the kind of movie where it would, but you, you could right. pull the rug out from under me and, and get. I've seen it done and work. I saw a movie recently that did it and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> Um, <laughs> speaking um, of like not are, are you good on that yeah okay speaking of not knowing about like or knowing that she's going to you know that 
the injection. There's a thing, I don't know, I don't know if there's a point to it, but one of the things I just wrote down was that no surprises, that we constantly know more uh, than, like, there's a lot of movies where you're trying to put the audience in the, the shoes of someone, but uh -huh. like we, we, we're kind of under the impression that, that, that Regina is our heroine. Yeah. And then the guy she bangs leaves in the morning and gets attacked by a zombie. Mm -hmm. So now, not only do we know that everyone outside is dead and she doesn't, which is fine, but now we also know that when she goes outside, like, there's a threat to her and she doesn't, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But as the movie progresses, um, like the movie, the first thing we see outside of the, the opening shot of the stars is the, the think tank group. So we already know that there's this other people that exist. And then with the, the phone call, the radio station, we then cut to them. So we don't do that thing where we're just with Regina and Sam. And then we find out that there's been this group the whole time. We know throughout that they're there. Now that we know yes. throughout that they're there, we see them get in the helicopter and take off when they're at the mall. So we know mm -hmm. that they're coming for them. So we already know yeah. what to expect. And then when they are in danger with the stock room guys, we see the fucking helicopter land. Like we see them arrive. Like you, if you had not shown it landing and you'd given me like 20 minutes, I might've forgotten about it. So that when mm. they save the day, I'd be like, oh yeah, those guys. Right. <laughs> constantly showing you them. So they don't let you ever have that. It's like the movie doesn't want to really surprise you or make you go, oh. It, they're like, no, we're just going to, don't, I don't know what the point of, I don't know if they're trying to say something with structure about it, but they constantly always inform us. Um, so there's never a rug pull. There's never really a reveal. Even when they first get to the radio station, it's a cool shot when we're going across and we see yes, Hector yes. behind the pillar. Yeah. So even then we're like, I know that there's someone there and you don't. Like I constantly know more than the characters in this movie. <laughs> And I'm, 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 I'm curious as to what was the logic behind that. Because you don't see it very um, often. Where it, it's that I mean, may, much. Maybe not to build necessarily tension in the scene, but to build tension for us caring about them. Because like now we know something they don't know. It's right. like, oh, but, but who well, is I get, that? I get, I get like, that who with Hector. Is, we don't know Hector yet. Right. Like, so who is it's that mostly, person? It's mostly the think tank stuff. Where like, they constantly mm -hmm. get back to them and, and, and take away any, if anything, the only mystery is, do we think they're good? Oh, no, it turns out, like, they're trying to create a vaccine, but it's at the expense of fucking healthy people. And, oh. Right, right. That's the only, like, infor blood. That's the yeah. only information that is revealed and kind of dolloped. And, uh, oh, I meant to look it up, but one of the two women that's going to gas the kids, I'm like, I've seen you in, like, a bunch of stuff. I know your fucking face. I need to look it up. Oh, but okay. She, she's I don't in know. tons of stuff. Uh, um, but, um, but, yeah. No, I, in, oh, in, by the in, way, also, yeah. I don't know if you can see it because i turned the brightness down uh but uh it's 1984 on imdb oh okay is it so yeah why did i write down 1982 maybe it was 82 on 2b okay i swear i saw 1982 somewhere okay. <laughs> <laughs> i'm crossing it out i just right now. i just want to get that in your face no um i'm <laughs> uh, sorry i make mistakes y'all um. but um <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, on, the, on the heels of like what you were just saying, like um, as far, th this is really telling about like how you and I experience films differently too, because you know me, I, I watch mysteries. I never know who the killer is. Even if I know who the killer is, I don't know who the killer is. Cause I'm like, maybe they just want me to think that way. And I, I don't see shit coming. I mean, sometimes I do if it's a really, really bad, right. bad, like, you know, straight back in the day with straight to DVD blockbuster produced horror movies that, you know, my sister and I would rent just because we needed a stack. And, but with this one, um, I'm such this movie's bitch that like, yeah, I'm, I'm just along for the ride, especially the second time because I've only seen it the one, one time before. There's only a few things that I really remember. Uh, it's more like images and feelings, you know, like I yeah. remember how, the, how this movie made me feel. So going back, it's like the plot stuff is what's really sticking this time. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, pl plot devices and also like filmmaking devices and things like that, like appreciating those a whole lot more, but, um, still on the ride, still on the ride going like, oh no, oh, so, well, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm writing the, the emotional it's interesting. sides of it. You're, you're, you're referencing mysteries where like, whereas I as a viewer, 
like predict where things are going and you uh -huh. don't see it. Whereas this isn't a mystery prediction. The movie is flat out saying these oh, people yeah, yeah, are yeah. coming to find the girls at the mall. <laughs> but how <laughs> do we know that they know to go into the mall? How do we know well, the mall's a big place? How do we know they're going to be in the well, stock they, room at they exactly did, yeah. the right moment? <laughs> also, I, I just want to say one thing. I don't have much to say on this. The stock room guys are fascinating to me because of their not just their apparel, but their energy, uh, especially, especially the main one. The Willie. Cat, this guy, I don't, I, I didn't IMDb him. He's, if, if it turned out he was the lead singer of a band and this was like his yeah. one acting role, I would so not fucking be surprised. Yeah. Um, he just seems like that type. But yeah. he's got this big joker grin full of teeth, this thin, angular face. And with these, he's got that, like, what a great, cocky noodly little scumbag of a character yeah. he's, so he's a ra rail thin rail and, thin and the way he speaks uh that sort of self-amuse you know uh attention shoppers and uh oh. hello out there he you know what he feels like to me and if this was the backstory i would love to find out if that's what the actor did to prepare but i, he, I guarantee you about a day or two ago that guy was a fucking loser <laughs> and he went and he got to put on a cool jacket and he's watched a bunch of tv and he knows how people mm -hmm. talk man and this is who i am now i'm like I, i'm the last guy in the store and now i'm in charge and this is my game like i guarantee you two days ago he'd never spoken to those girls that way he feels right like, he feels like such a fucking poser to me i didn't think about it like that all i thought about it was like he is at i mean it all makes sense no, because he is absolutely he is perverse in his toxicity. Mm -hmm. He's like, everything about him makes me uncomfortable. It makes me want to like go the other way. It's another character that I'm just kind of like, I remember disliking you and I don't remember disliking you for long. So hope, I don't think you're long for this world um, yeah. or for this movie. So I, I can bear it, but there's something he, unbearable about it. He is the anti- yeah. His performance is the anti Catherine Mary Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he absolutely is unbearable. But my added yes. thing is, I also like to imagine that he is he he is that case. You see it in a few things. They do it in The Walking Dead a little bit too, where like, this is who I was in the before world, but now that the right. world is this, I'm giving myself a freedom to be this. Ah, uh, yeah. And, I've uh, never thought of, I never thought of that, and that's. I think that's remarkable. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to see him any other way now. And that makes it even worse. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Because it's like, imagine if you did know him. You'd just be like, Willie. I mean, we don't even know if Willie's his real name. Like, he's wearing a robe that says fucking Willie on it. Right. But, but he's, he's credited as Willie, so we'll just call him Willie. So just imagine that's his actual name. And, and you just be like, Willie. <laughs> <sighs> and that blonde what? guy is creepy, too. He's so stoic. And I just, yeah, the, the good oh. casting with all of them. They're great. They're terrifying. They remind me, they have a similar kind of like vibe for me, except a, a more adult, I guess. But they remind me of, um, what are they called in Return to Oz? On the fucking the wheelers? wheels. The wheelers, yes. Yeah. They kind of remind, oh, just that he, same kind of like, just he, get away from me. I just want to run. I just want to be away But also the lead wheeler is so, he, he has this maniacal laugh that is just a laugh to intimidate. Exactly. And there's it's a glee, all... there's an intent. And even though this yeah. guy's not laughing, he has the same intent. Yes, it's like just get away from me. You're yeah. you're you're disturbing and you could do some damage if I ever if the power ever shifted, you know. Right. And I don't like it. I don't trust you. <laughs> I don't want to be around you. You're effective. <laughs> Good for you, movie. Uh that's all I have to say about them. Speaking of <laughs> things that we I that ew, get away from me I don't like is uh this movie yeah. com this movie commits one of those 80 sins that we didn't that at least I wasn't aware of it as a sin in the 80s <laughs> but in 2020 the f word the, f -word, the three letter f word we're just it, it happens in bill it happens stuff but you know when you're yeah like, oh, I'm, you're such a sweet movie and then oh that happens. this one, there, this there, one there's, there's actually two little instances for me in this that, that okay yeah it's a practically perfect movie there's two moments that don't age well for me okay the, and one of the bummers is that um, that word gets dropped in the middle of a perfectly interesting conversation to have. 
yeah. when you're like, he didn't hit on you last night? Like, he didn't make a right. move? Well, and she's like, in, in L.A. of all places. And I'm like, <laughs> she's not wrong. It is worth thinking about. And I love that Kathy yeah. Mary Stewart is like, no, of course not. And then she like, thinks yes. about it. <laughs> what if Hector like, is? Yeah. And I like that the options are, well, he's either a firm or a gentleman. And I was like, you you might have found a but yeah, just the fact that and they also stopped, the, like the they last stopped to have that conversation. Earth, yeah. <laughs> they stopped yeah. to have that conversation about supposedly the last man on earth. Uh, I've been around, not obviously they're having this conversation on their own, but I've been privy to that sort of conversation about <laughs> a guy that like some girls like, and and I'm like, so I get that they took the time to write that. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's an unfortunate choice of words, but yeah. yeah. I, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I won't speak on behalf of my community or anything like that, because right. obviously I don't like the word. I don't like hearing it, but I'm, I'm hearing it through the 1980s lens. And also there's something about the context, like you mentioned, uh, the Bill and Ted context, which we've covered, right. <laughs> that, you know, that really bothers me because it's, it's calling, it's calling somebody something, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and also where it's coming from right. and why. She's not like, like being like, ew, you, whatever. Like, they're merely it's part of her vernacular. It's, exactly. It's like, it's in, it's in a droll kind of like, you know, like, also, I mean, because she's putting on airs to try and sound more sophisticated than she is, Samantha is. Yeah. I mean, she's really trying to plant the seed to get Regina's uh, focus off of Hector because we know as she reveals uh, later when Regina's being flown away that yes. she wants to try. Yeah. Um, so she doesn't really believe it. She's just trying to build, playfully build on her, uh, play on her sister's uh, insecurities um, <laughs> with the yeah, last, if, last man on earth. If you and change so it the it, word, it doesn't give me this, yeah. If, if you, you change, change the word out, the intention else. of the scene is still the same. Whereas in other movies, yeah. it is being used in an insulting, yeah, homophobic yeah. way. Yeah. But, but I mean, still, I'm I just can... I'm just pointing out that like it's another '80s movie where yeah. uh, record scratch. <laughs> like, it's just part of like growing it's... up and, and looking back on certain movies, going ah fuck, there's a record scratch. In this yeah, movie. if they if they were to make <laughs> like if they were to reboot the movie or or even just like you know like make that movie today, like she they probably have a much more uh, woke conversation. <laughs> but I'm, but they could be still be speculating about the same kind of thing about like mm -hmm. you know and and just minus the word like that word would not be included because it would not be accepted because immediately it tells you something about the character like, oh, look, I'm comfortable. But, you know, I, I, I again, I can watch it through the 80s lenses and it doesn't make me, it doesn't make me uncomfortable. It doesn't make me sit there and go, oh, oh, she talks that way. I'm just kind of like, oh, I mean, to consider the time. I mean, right. <laughs> so I'm not defending it. I'm just yeah. saying I watch it, you know, with context. There's a lot so. of record scratch moments that I, a lot of them where I can go, oh, well, consider the time versus, oh, yeah. You son of a bitch. That's not great. Exactly. Um, like, oh, this did not age for. But the what other was the other one, moment for you? The other yeah. one for me, and it's to me, it's a little. I don't want to say more egregious, but like, uh, it's it's less excusable. It, it it's less of oh at the time, although in a weird way it is a little bit. Um, two things. I don't understand why she's like, all right, Hector. I'm like, are you trying to imply like that his name is Hispanic? Like, why the emphasis on Hector? Uh, but then later, when she's judging his gun, she's like, that's okay for a date night in the barrio. And I'm like, the fuck? What the fuck is that shit? Two things about that. <laughs> one, I'm going to skip over one and go to two. Two, I at least like the fact that after, like a sentence or two later, Hector's like, Tate out of the barrio. And I'm like, thank you for acknowledging that she fucking said that to your brown face. We didn't, we didn't just let the line happen. And and yeah. as a writer didn't acknowledge that that's fucked up, or as a character, he acknowledged, what the fuck did you say? You fucking said that even, right, even right, he's right. not grilling her for it. He is telling, I fucking heard you say that to my face. Um, yes. almost a little amused or a little confused. Um uh, it's the kind of thing. <laughs> That sounds like she's not necessarily, you could argue that she's just talking about the gun, but it also to me sounds like she's talking about who had the gun. <laughs> um, yes. The brown man she's standing in front of. Exactly. Um, yeah. And now part of me chalks it up to just uh, the 80s era's way of being kind of dismissive of, of, of him. Mm hmm. 
without too much malicious intent. I think it was more, but there is definitely a judgment call. Yeah. I don't, I, I think the judgment call is there, but the severity of intent uh, for being racist or judgmental isn't, isn't that heavy. However, so if I saw that scene in the 80s, I would have chuckled about it. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm not flat out offended by it now, that line does play differently in 2020, just of how we view things like that. And if that line had been written and freshly used in a movie in 2020, I'd be like, what the fuck? Like in this era, you're going to say that? That's fucked. That's a fucking weird, shitty way of saying something. A um, line like that is designed to give you, again, like a framework with, through which right. to view a character and be like, oh, now I know something about you. Right. Must um, we do where, this again? Where, where <laughs> is, it seems a little more, um, not jokey, but, you know, sort of uh, for her character. And I guess that's also uh, another good thing about Catherine Mary Stewart as an actress is that I, I still love her character even after she says that. <laughs> <laughs> honestly um i must have missed it i must have been like just like in my notes and maybe the first time it didn't register or maybe i just didn't retain it um so yeah so hearing yeah. it like the second you said it, i was just like oh you saw me I'm like, holy shit um <laughs> imagine if it, you know like a handsome white dude said that to you like oh is this for a date night in the barrio you'd be like what the I'd fuck like, later <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? oh Good night. <laughs> right. But something don't, don't. about, I don't, yeah, it's not, something about the 80s and how not woke yet that we were, or they were, yeah. everyone was. I, I don't think it was written out of mean-spiritedness, but it's not total ignorance either. It is mm -hmm. a judgment she's making. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't say... make her a fucking bitch. <laughs> no, because it's well, also because he gets to respond to it, but also, mm -hmm. um, like, to, again, doesn't seem like, again, kind of like contextually inaccurate. Like, I, I fully believe that, like, a not not that Catherine Mary Stewart, but that a Regina, you know, right, um, in a similar situation, a similar discourse with a Hector might say something like that quite mindlessly and not even you know give you know give two thoughts about it i believe that might even happen today again oh, tells you something yeah. yeah it tells you something about like you know like okay context it, is everything yeah. how is he receiving it like okay we, we can have happening that today in 2020 is different than the way it happened uh, that well because i mean you, here you uh, i'm glad that we've uh, completely spelled out that it's <laughs> it was released in 1984 because immediately my mind goes to uh, Nick Corey uh, in Nightmare on Elm Street, also released 1984, who was a Mexican American actor who changed his. I don't even remember what his actual last name is, but he changed it to Corey. So his on, on the uh, uh, advice of his agent because Mex a Mexican actor wasn't going to get any work. So oh. they were going to push like he could pass for Italian. And if he can be Italian, he can be sexy, you know, machismo, you know, whatever kind of thing. And we can, we can sell that. But if we try to sell you as Mexican, you're not going to get any work. So, I mean, that's very, very much the same kind of like reality. They were both, you know, shot at the same time and released the same mm -hmm. year. So, I mean, there's something contextually, I think, that we can take from that detail <laughs> about yeah. at least... The, from a filmmaking aspect, like what, what, how, how were Latino actors and how were Latino characters kind of viewed and what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable to be told to Latino actors and Latino characters at that time. So, yeah. Um, thanks for bringing that up though. Yeah. Cause I, I didn't need, like I said, I didn't and, even. I mean, on the plus side though, like he's still a Latino character played by a Latino actor in an eighties movie. He's like the third biggest yeah. lead in the role in the movie. And the fact that, as a truck driver, they didn't give him like a netted truck hat and he's not like, hey, was a, like, he's not doing like a Cheech impression. Yeah. And like what we yeah. think of as like a Hispanic in the movie, you know? Yeah. No, and no, oh my God. Okay, because that's not Basically, thing there's no A in it. No. <laughs> <laughs> like they didn't, yeah, they didn't say like, could you just be more, you barrio? know, la like a Latin? More barrio. Yeah. yeah. Like, she, she says you're in a barrio, like, She's got to get that from somewhere, from maybe yeah. from the way you talk. Yeah. Anyway, and we know that there's that 
story as well. <laughs> Not in this movie, but in, in other actors' experiences in movies throughout the 80s. But um, no, um, uh, da, 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 da. no, one thing that I do love that they give him that I feel like I would attribute to a lot of um, Latinos that, that we're, we've always kind of like been allowed to have in cinema is a love of family. And I feel he it. He goes back home. Goes, he wants to go home. He needs, like, she says, you know, they're not. And it's like, but you know for sure. I don't, don't. know that I, yet. I, I have get to it. go home. I have to see. Yeah, absolutely. I get oh. why she wants him to stay. Protection. She yeah. likes him. Like, yeah, I get it. But like, yeah. oh, I get what he's coming from. And then when he gets home, like, I totally buy, number one, that it's home, even though it's not, you know, his family, <laughs> the yeah. actor's family, or uh, even remotely Latino people, apparently, in the portraits. But one thing, there was one little detail when he gets into the house, though, that, that just kind of breaks my heart, that, that really makes it personal. There, he sees, because it's Christmas, you know, the house is decorated, and there's a string of lights that fell off the hook. And he just kind of, like, puts it back up on the hook and just walks around just kind of like assessing like to see is anybody here is anybody mm -hmm. you know has anybody turned is there anything that i'm gonna have to you know like face and luckily he was spared that like i get i get a sense that the boy he sees is not no <laughs> from just that some house. fucking kid yeah yeah <laughs> and, um but yeah there, there's just something really really personal about that space and and watching the the the, the red that ha you know it hadn't rained yet so the red smog mm -hmm. is still in the air and watching it just kind of like seep into his home the same way it did samantha's and reggie's um it it's it again it takes a moment that you don't really need uh for this movie because we you know we still don't really know him yet he could just be a supporting role i didn't i remember uh being surprised the first time i saw the movie surprised that we spent any more time with him alone without the girls right. so i thought they were our anchor so i was like oh i always given... find it fresh that like we cut away yeah. to that like we're actually like giving him like a, a little bit more to like kind of put us on his side and again it's not there's no big speeches. There's no really big dramatic thing. Like he doesn't have to face his mother, <laughs> you know, turned and, you know, have a big heartbreak. It's just, he has to go home. And, mm -hmm. and once he does, he gets the sexiest Buick I've ever seen on screen <laughs> and comes back dressed in a Santa suit and with flowers, flowers and, and, and it, he had, gifts or something too didn't he oh because he it looked like he took gifts from like under the tree that yeah. maybe were going to be for somebody else and he just said oh you know what maybe they can get oh my god my heart my heart like again little things just he's little a good details dude. throughout this movie. yeah he's not an effort he is a gentleman and he's <laughs> he's a good dude he's a real mensch what's the hispanic word for mensch <laughs> um I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there isn't a cultural. I don't think. I don't think we have a mensch equivalent. I'll yeah. have to think for a while. Like, I mean, like Holmes. I don't think. No, <laughs> Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. I don't know. It's not. <laughs> Back to <laughs> all roads are going to lead to the marked ones with me. But <laughs> how many times anyway. can we reference Chris Sarandon in a in a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> But um, um, I'm glad that you mentioned the Santa Claus and Christmas thing because that's I always I admit it only clicked with me this time. You know, there's plenty of movies that take place uh, Christmas time. You know, there's the official Christmas movies, but then there's your Die Hard, your Batman Returns. You know, your your does it count as a Christmas movie? You know, uh, yeah. that little subgenre mm -hmm. that I go yeah. yes that that th these are my fun unofficial Christmas movies, and we can debate <laughs> whether they are or not. And what's fun about this one though is it doesn't beat you over the head. Uh, like you know, Die Hard's taking place at a Christmas party. You know, Batman Returns mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. of the year, Christmas shopping. Um, you know, the carolers. You know, in the background of you know of the of the fifteen extras walking by in, in Gotham City. <laughs> 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 and with this movie, it's just it's like eleven shopping days till Christmas, and yeah. there's Christmas songs on the radio, and there's Christmas decorations in the house. The most overt it gets is his uh, his Santa suit. And I wouldn't say that you should watch this movie at Christmas, like the few days leading up to it, like with Die Hard and Gremlins and the ref. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're going to be doing all month long, you, mm -hmm. you could start off December with this because this, 
warms you up as a sort of Christmas time set. Mm. And I think I would even it, as that. I think it's a good day after Christmas movie oh. too. Just be, well, just because. Okay, I think about like the mania. I mean, who knows what this? We're in 2020, and what this holiday season has in store for us. Um, but you know, I tend to associate Christmas with a manic scramble and with you know a relentlessness, <laughs> and, and there's almost kind of like an exhale at the end of it. So it'd be nice to kind of like kind of like finish off Christmas, like, you know, December 26th in the morning or even the night of, just kind of like say goodbye to Christmas oh, okay. with this movie because it ends with a very spring feeling kind yes. of uh, section with the kids getting their pictures taken and everything like that. And, um, and it doesn't feel Christmassy at all. The ending, yeah, feels quite kind of like uh, dated, you know, uh, uh, daily practice. And, um, so yeah, so I, I I would say it's an ideal December twenty sixth if you still want to like you know get just squeeze the last little Christmas uh, cinema out of and, your your viewing diet. <laughs> and I would go the opposite end if it's eleven days shopping days left till Christmas. So oh, the fourteenth. I would watch it on the fourteenth. That's fun. That's yeah, the that's day to watch. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yes. I have uh, the the Santa thing. I fucking yep. hate though the lab technicians with the Santa thing, telling the kids that they're gonna wake up and <laughs> be with Santa and shit. <laughs> and doesn't she even say? I think it's no, no. It's fucked up. But like once removed and observing, I think it's fucking mean as <laughs> shit. It's hilarious. Like of all the things to lie to a kid about, like oh, uh -huh. no one do you get to see Santa Claus? You gotta stay with him forever. <laughs> Oh God! And doesn't Regina point out how like that's sick or something yeah. like that? Like, and I'm just like, think oh, yes. Well, what's going on here? Oh, there's something. We're gonna meet Santa Claus, and they they cut to them like, <laughs> it's not just just that you're sick, but like they're like, yeah, we're fucking guilty pieces of shit. I know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the note. I love because oh, it yeah. pays off yes. when they leave them sitting there chuckling and everything like that. And what did it say? Going to see Santa. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, that's called poetic justice, motherfucker. Anyway, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. No, nothing specific. I'm actually, I'm trying to look up uh, who the one of those other, like the, the gas ad administer people that I recognized, but I'll, I'll look it up later. Oh, okay. Um, um, there's one moment in that also when uh, it's revealed that Samantha, I love the line, it's another line, where she just gives this broad smile and, uh, and, uh, and Reggie looks at her and just like, I thought you were dead. She's just like, or no, they told me you were dead. She's like, they're exaggerating totally. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's dry, it's, it's weightless. <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I I really I really appreciate her delivery. <laughs> did you find anything, any leads? I did not, but I fucking give up. <laughs> okay, um, you'll, you'll see her again. It'll come up in another movie talk. <laughs> there are a few um, little random other moments that I I like that I didn't get to mention. Oh please! The very beginning of the movie. At the yeah. montage over L.A., we get to the exterior of L.A., we get to the interior of L.A., and I don't remember the actor's name, but, like, the manager of the movie theater behind the counter, I, I just know him as, um, I, I, I think it's Uncle Willie, but either way, he's Weird Al's uncle in UHF. He's the one who uh -huh. like, gives him the UHF station. Yes. And he's always on the phone with Mr. Big or whatever. Um, <laughs> he, I, you can tell, none, this wasn't scripted, but it, the... Uh, it's even more fun because it's he is selling, trying to sell this guy. They're constantly just cutting back to her playing the video game and the crowds. And then this, he's trying to sell this guy the headband with springy antenna. Yeah. And and you could tell they're like, um, just you know, these are going to be seven fifty, and then these are nine fifty, and try to sell it to this guy. We're just we just need some footage, and just the fact that he's like, hey, you know, look at this. And you pull this, and you pull it. Look at that. Look at that. Nine fifty. Come on. I know you got nine fifty. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this one's seven fifteen, but this is my best one. This is my top. Like, if you actually just listen to what he's saying, it's a great performance from like a throwaway <laughs> moment. And it's look what she's wearing. What she's wearing there is a seven fifty, and it's almost like insulting. But this is our best stuff. 
<laughs> you got this one here and you got this thing here and you got the two things here and he, and they got the streamers on he's like go ahead blowing it blowing them see see what they, see what happens when you blow on it <laughs> like, <laughs> I want to watch a whole movie of him selling antennas to a guy. <laughs> it is so not important to the movie, but I just lean forward and I'm like, God bless you, sir. <laughs> fucking, <laughs> fucking great. Um, a little and, thing and in the beginning, and I didn't again, get to all that, Oh, yes. No, yes. Saying, that's, that to me is like the little salt in the soup that the movie's constantly sprinkling in. Well, there's one for me really early on. I think it's the moment. I already talked about the moment that I know I love Samantha, but the moment that I know I fucking love uh, Reggie is um, already I love her like playing video games and giving a shit that like somebody's like horning in on her game. But the fact that she's like laying there and they're discussing like what the projection room is made out of is like because oh, okay. super- it's made out of, you know, it's made out of steel and Superman can't see through steel. And she's like, Superman can't see through lead, you nerd. Oh. <laughs> I remember just kind of being, as a Superman stan, I'm sitting here just kind of like, and I love you. Right. Because you know that, and because you're criticizing him. Even though you're calling him a nerd, you're the nerd. And it's right. Just... <laughs> How, it's funny. I mean, yeah. One of my favorite moments is, is also, uh, it's the morning after from that scene. Mm. And again, yeah. I like when someone says this, and then the next line is this. And he's like, hey, can, can you do me this favor? She's like, did you a favor last night? Yes! Yes! <laughs> That's when I'm like, I like you. Because the oh, Superman he's... thing, I appreciate, but the fact that, because yeah. I'm also watching it, not to be too judgy, but I just, I look at him and I look at her and I'm like, why is this, ha- why, why is she, <laughs> why is this happening? Why is she choosing this? And because I like, the he's there. She, I like yeah. that she's like acknowledging, like, I did your fucking favor, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of says it out loud like enough for him to maybe hear it but definitely yeah. enough to be like <laughs> for us to hear it and it's one of my favorite da, da, yeah. Da, da. <laughs> yeah it's great and lets us know as the audience also especially first time watch like oh that's not your boyfriend <laughs> right I, and i love that they wrote it as just like yeah this is guy and yeah i gotta stay here because if we go out the door, we get locked down. I need to get this film can. You want to stay in here? I'll give you 15 bucks because I'm making 110. I'll gut yeah. you in on the profits if you stay. And I like that she points out, like, do you know what that fucking makes me sound like? And I like that they clarify that. Because yeah. she was just like, sure, 15 bucks. I'd be like, ew, you whore. But she's like, uh, am I your whore? Fuck you. And like they yeah. have that conversation. It's yeah. Great. I really love her character. We are literally watching her question her life choices right <laughs> in that scene <laughs> yeah like i'm fucking this guy in a projection room when i could be outside right. the <laughs> 15 bucks which makes out. me oh, I, I, this I mean, is, yeah 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 no i i she can correct people on superman she plays video games competitively she looks adorable in a, in a little red fucking uh, usher outfit with the black slacks and the little black stripe and and i just swoon and she could mm-hmm. kick my ass <laughs> yeah it's an important trait absolutely <laughs> anyway um, go on one thing that well because this is the thing i love the turn she takes in the end and i wonder if it's just my stupid male mind because because i think because I, I feel like she loves it too but uh, I mean, Catherine Mary Stewart seems to love playing that <laughs> mm-hmm. when they're when they're in the end and she's taking the Polaroids and everything like that. Oh, yeah. And I love that she takes a picture of Hector and just handsome. <laughs> <laughs> she turns so instantly that. motherly. And then as Samantha is like watching them, like you know, descend the little steps from where they were. And she was like, God, they look like the Brady Bunch. I can hear, like, in the voiceover, I can hear just like, ooh, I just love these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there's something about, because the thing is, even though there's not really anything of that, like, planted in her character throughout the movie, I would love to know, because I, re- I remember we watched with my sister and with Tracy, and I think they both really enjoyed the, where the movie landed too, uh, but I would love to know, like, just like you know, like more and more, like how how do women feel about this ending? Because here we go from her, you know, starting out as like a uh, you know the word that Catherine Mary Stewart used, a relatively tomboyish character who can handle herself and who does all the things, and then just kind of like 
immediately, happily assumes the role of like wife and mother, um, and uh, like aggressively, enthusiastically <laughs> embraces it. And I, what I like about it is, is because like, as far as we know, they are the last people on earth. So she's just embracing this role as mother earth. She knows, she, she sees the responsibility. Maybe it's just the Virgo in me. But <laughs> she sees the responsibility. She sees what it could cost if they start living lawlessly. You know, like right. she wants it to be a civilized society that they rebuild and everything. The burden and, of civilization um, falls on them. Like she understands that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, there's something about that that I that, that I actually really really like. I, it feels like not necessarily even growth, but like a turn. Like a, a like yes. she's not going to be this way for the rest of her life. But, because uh, I would think at a certain point, she's going to have to loosen up a little bit and let go and, you know, be kind of like, okay, it's starting to be bestowed upon the heads of, like, my children and my children's children and that kind of thing. Or maybe we'll meet more people. You know, we don't know what's ahead for her. But, if, I, but there's something about her, I think it is the enthusiasm. It's yes. not passive. It's not submissive she just seems to have kind of like found her niche. And because she didn't have that, she had herself and she had her sister and now her family has just grown and she's happy that? about that. There's something about that that I like, yeah. I, I used to think it was just about like the absence of the rest of humanity. So I will kind of step into this motherly role. Yeah. And I like, and I like the way you worded it about mother earth. Uh, the fact that she gets, we need structure to for civilization to move on. Yeah. But I only, on this viewing, clicked in my head that she tells, she's telling her story to Hector. Mm. That not only do we know that her stepmom sucks, mm. but that also her mom pieced out really early on when, when her dad came back right. from the war. So I feel like for a majority of their life, she hasn't had a traditional mother. Right. So now she gets to fulfill and be the thing that she hasn't had. So Aww, that feels like yeah. more of a personal choice than I'd ever registered before. It made me think of like, uh, if you ever listen to Kevin Smith talk about Jay Muse in, as a father. He's oh like, yeah. Jay Muse is the greatest father because his father wasn't present for him. So like right. he didn't have a traditional family. So he craves having that traditional family. And I kind yes. of feel that way about her and the concept of the mother in this Yeah, movie. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm glad you, you brought that up too, because I hadn't, and only the second viewing, so I hadn't put that together yet. But that's, yeah. Yeah, awesome. you, you, there's, there's enough that multiple viewings, you start to fucking peel back some fucking onion layers, man. This yeah, and, not... they're there, and, they're, and they're there to be peeled, too. That's, yeah. that's, that's a gift. Um, that said, um, one of my favorite exchanges in the entire movie is uh, in the last few minutes of it. When... <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Actually, I, I have one note left, and I'm curious if your note is the same as mine. <laughs> well, it's, Go it's on. Just, it's just dialogue. It's yeah, I mean so also, mine. also also the way they wrap it up. Yeah. Just great car. Thanks. I have 23 of them. You want to go for a ride? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> he's, he delivers it even more naturally than I just read it. Like it's so there's this strange unassuming quality to the actor who's playing Danny Mason uh Keener mm -hmm. that uh 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 I welcome that I actually am like, God, if they would have, if I could have like been certain that they would have gotten it right and gotten everybody back, I would have loved a sequel. I would have loved a series, you right. know? <laughs> I, I feel like it, it's funny you should mention that because I was yes. like, this was actually a movie. I would have preferred a, a follow-up series or sequel that took place within a few years after the first movie. Mm. However, since that's not an option now, I actually would not mind a legacy sequel where, oh. it's, where our leads are the two kids grown up now. Oh. And those are your main characters living in an apocalyptic world. And you can tell like a sort of city-based Mad Max story, whatever the fuck you want to tell. But in a supporting role mm -hmm. would be Kelly Maroney and fucking uh, uh, Robert... Beltram and, and uh, Captain Mary Stewart, like you can get them back, but not necessarily do so much about member berries that it's them again. Like let the story be like the the new kids growing up in this world. But what a, like I I give I give me that legacy twenty thirty years later sequel. I'd actually yeah. I'd actually welcome me too. 
Me too. Oh my gosh, with open arms. Um, what was what, um, what was that? What you wanted to say, or was there something? Same else? scene, but no, completely different moment. Um, oh, okay. Actually, do, do you have much left? No. Okay. Um, before I go to that, I just I think it's funny. I just watched Salem's Lot. Uh, oh, okay. literally a yes. few days ago, and then Jeffrey Lewis shows up in this as that lead doctor. And then if you ever IMDb him, because you look at his face, and I'm like, well, I've seen you in stuff. I'm like, he's in mm. everything. <laughs> mm. But uh, but this is a, a pretty. Sometimes he gets to play quirky or supporting characters. But I like what he plays. He plays good menace in this, mm -hmm. uh, especially as he starts the turn. Anyway, I just want to give I want to give Jeffrey Lewis some credit there. Okay. Um, because he has such expressive eyes to me. Uh, uh, yes. Both good or bad. <laughs> like I, I'll. It's such a stupid I'm, side tangent. It's such a stupid moment, but it, not stupid. But in in Devil's Rejects. Mm -hmm. When he's at the motel going to the ice machine and he's talking to baby. Yeah. And she's like, I bet all the girls want to fuck you. And he's like, did you say that again? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> there's, there's, he, there's, especially once they're all in the motel room together, like there, he, there's so uh -huh. much sadness, but also like he, I think he passed away like five years ago, but I mean, that dude mm. has had a, a healthy, sizable career and he can kind of just do anything you need him to do. Right. I don't recall a lot of movies where he gets to do what he does in Night of the Comet. So like, right on. Right, yeah. Um, uh, no, uh, the, the ending of the movie, the, it's a little moment that just makes me chuckle. And to me, it's kind of, it's a, uh, I feel like is emblematic the right word? Because emblematic is negative context. I don't know. It sort of summarizes my whole feelings about the movie where uh, it's after, yeah, I got 23 cars. Um, <laughs> she's like, well, we'll have her home by midnight. And he's like, oh, midnight. And she's like, yeah, the burden of civilization falls on us. And he's like, yeah, bitching, isn't it? Like, <laughs> so like, yeah, like, yeah, that's a daunting sentence. And he's just like, yeah, bitching, right? <laughs> yeah and it seems to me like the whole movie where like everyone's dead <laughs> that's a shitty you're driving around an empty city where everyone's gone and it's still kind of like yeah me and my sister and like now oh, we're gonna go shopping and and oh hector and if you describe this premise it sounds terrible but the movie's still like bitching right <laughs> driving into the sunset like yeah also that, finding out that, that exchange was, is the movie <laughs> yeah yeah no also the fact that we uh, i love that we come full circle because the mystery in the beginning yes. with the dmk and if you're really paying attention to danny mason keener you're just kind of like danny mason dmk <gasps> that's the son of a bitch who got number six on her then, winning streak <laughs> and if you're not noticing it the license plate shot Yes. yes. I'll never forget. I, I, I showed that to Tracy uh, and the shot. She just went, <gasps> DMK! <laughs> <laughs> and I love that we don't get a shot of Regina seeing it and going, ooh, like, it's just like, oh, it's going to come out at some point. Like, this is, mm. yeah. And that's why yeah. I want a sequel. Like, that's why I wanted, like, if you, yeah. if you did a TV series, you know, they're, they're back finding it out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. They, like, they, they talked about yeah. how like originally DMK, that was not part of the ending. Oh really? He, the DMK being on the score was just to establish her personality as kind of a tomboy in the video games and that she's competitive and, and stuff. Okay. Um, and it wasn't until that they were in production that like people on the crew were like, well, who's DMK? And he's like, uh, what are you talking about? They're like, well, who, who is DMK? And she's like, I don't right. know. And then they kept asking him, he's like, who fucking cares? It's just a stupid thing on the thing. It's not, <laughs> it's not a thing. And then the fact that everyone kept asking him made him realize it is a thing. Yeah. But I mean, it's funny that that wasn't a thing because I mean, the very next scene, she goes <laughs> up to the projection booth and she's like, hey, do you know anyone with the initials DMK? Well, like, yeah. it's on her fucking yeah. mind. Like the movie... <laughs> puts the seed into our brain dirt like yes so much and I, it's funny because we were talking about like how well directed it is this is like it's like accidentally well directed because i don't think he knew at the time maybe that 
the language of cinema, uh, well, let's say the layman's general language of cinema, because people break the rules of this language. All, you know, movies in Italy have this kind of flavor, and movies over here, right. this means that. But generally speaking, if you are cutting into such tight close-ups of her entering the thing, and then a close-up of her face reacting, and then a close-up of like the other thing, and then like her mm -hmm. reaction, like by using such tight close-ups of those things, you're making them matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you accidentally made it matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you and want it, it, like if yeah, you type you it out, to... you don't think it's a big deal, but unfortunately you yeah. shot it to make yes. it a big deal. Yeah, if you wanted to make it matter less or make it more about just her, yeah, you probably want to do like maybe a, a shot from behind where we don't even see the screen, but we just see her reaction and turning around and being, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there, there's other ways to get around her, it to like her, get across what he wanted to, but yeah, yeah he, he he unwittingly was planting this scene. Yeah, I'm and not, the fact that, not... that that's not how it ended, and now yeah. it like, because then I imagine how would the ending be? Well, the ending's already funny. She gets in the car with this guy, they drive off, but now you've got a fucking, not only do you have a button, but it, it gets such a reaction out of you that it's a cherry on top and you're ending on a fucking high. Yes. What a glorious accident <laughs> for the crew to be like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> and then just as credits roll, you just see like the, the little boy and Hector just playing catch in the street. In the street. <laughs> By the way, I just realized this right now, all that shit about crossing the street against the light, but now they can play in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> she's still she's still getting used to wearing that still mom funny. hat you know yeah. <laughs> i guess crossing is different than playing True. i mean yeah because i mean she just proved, actually yeah that just proved her point yeah about not crossing against the light because he almost fucking hit samantha and yet well i guess they figured like you know what it's probably one of those strange uh, 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 rationalizations that you can make in your mind was like, well, that's the car we saw today. We won't see another one for another, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, like, the likelihood of us seeing more than one car in a day, you know, not, yeah. it's not going to happen. So play freely, kids. We saw our car. <laughs> we'll, I'll start the, you know, I'll, I'll start. Ooh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> my brain just went somewhere. So you know how like Where? random things that are like connected universes and shit? Give me a movie that just takes place in an apocalyptic city or something. And then at one point we go to LA and it's, and they mention that like, the, like set, here, don't do a direct sequel. Just set a movie in the apocalypse. And the source mm -hmm. of it was, well, the meteor, or no, the, the, the comet that passed 30 years ago. And mm. that's when we go to LA and maybe you just encounter like this 38 year old white kid and an Asian girl. And we're like, oh, this is <laughs> the night of the Comet universe, we, you know? I would love, I love that kind of shit. Yeah, I love awesome. secret shared universes, you know what I mean? Sometimes. Like, well, <laughs> like I like that Romy and Michelle takes place in the Quentin Tarantino universe. Or mm. uh, my favorite one, side tangent but my favorite fucking one ever is that the friday the 13th reboot it takes place in the transformers universe <laughs> right because uh what's his name that douchey guy the blonde guy yeah in transformers <laughs> and he's the same character yes he has so the same name and the same random. hair and everything yeah so <laughs> random <laughs> i mean i get no. you know one's produced by michael bass production company and the one's directed and coped but like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. No, my mind just went to like the way they introduced uh, Blair Witch as uh, uh, the woods or whatever. Um, um, it, yeah. And then surprise. Yeah. yeah. Who cared? No. <laughs> I didn't enjoy that. But <laughs> I remember, I remember I was at Comic Con that year because they unveiled it. I was at Comic Con and people outside were handing out flyers to go to a screening that night of a movie called The Woods. And I'm like, the fuck is the woods like i come to comic con for ip that i recognize you know what is this yeah. shit the woods fuck off and then the next morning i'm reading the news that like at the screening of the woods they announced you're seeing blair witch and that's the real title i was like what i would have fucking gone and then i eventually because at the time we didn't know that it yeah. was going to be fucking ball sack and uh yeah that there are people who also, really like that movie there are people yeah who enjoy it i don't 
sorry if you're one of them watching this because we don't no, <laughs> no judgment but you know no judgment but it's but one day one day we'll have a talk about even it. <laughs> the writer of it acknowledges like uh so yeah in interviews yeah <laughs> oh I just want to leave with one lasting thought. It's not an epiphany or anything, but I just think the symmetry of it's nice that in mm. the same year that the last Starfighter came out, yeah. Alex Rogan is the arcade player and she's his girlfriend. But in this movie, she gets to be the gamer. <gasps> like both movies oh. feature an arcade console severely, but I like that she gets, she gets to be the joystick controller in this movie. You know what I'm going to like? of the one that roots for him to get the high school. Yeah. If they ever do a legacy, a legacy sequel, you know what I'm going to like? The only video games that will exist in that <laughs> world will yeah. be like 1980s nope. uh, arcade games. And, yeah. And maybe, maybe like a home console for an Atari or something like that. But, and they're going to be yeah. listening to everything on record and cassettes and shit. Yeah. Yeah. How awesome is that? <laughs> well, a, a legacy sequel would be rough because... 30 go next year would be like 29 years later right um actually no less than that i'm going off of 82 you, you fucking planted the i'm 82 sorry scene. no but okay so 26 years later whatever uh 36 i don't fucking know um like everything like you're not those generators are done like it's a much more severe world Mm-hmm. you know i i don't know like part of me likes the idea that they get to run around in a city that's still like for this movie it's so typical to just be like, well, it's I Am Legend, and it's, you know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know if I need to see that aspect of it, the more I think maybe about they, it. Maybe they city jump, because, unless, you know, unless like... Unless they still keep that, that, like, the way the Bill and Ted sequels, like, the, they never change. Yeah. If they never change, <laughs> but the world, you know what I mean? That's... I mean, you know how we felt about face the music. Like, yeah, yeah that's the way to go. I as yeah. long. It, I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, the world can change, but their spirit and the way they deal with things better be the same, and they better be stronger because they've got more family now. I want yeah. no liabilities in that family. I want togetherness. I want healing. I want. You know, they can. They can have banter and bicker all they want. Oh, I didn't get. Okay, I do have one more thing to address. Oh, okay. Um, something gets addressed when um, Samantha and uh, uh, Reggie are standing uh, on one of those like bridges, like looking down over uh, everything. And she's talking about like every guy that I have my eye on, like, you know, you whatever. And uh-huh. like, she even pushes Reggie. Yeah. And, and Reggie feels like, you know, like, I mean, it, uh, you think this scene is going to take like one particular turn and they even did what? plant the seeds for it like earlier. But then all of a oh, sudden she, she just looks into her eyes. Yeah. And they, but neither one of them really knows what to do. And so what does Regina do? She starts to laugh. And Samantha doesn't laugh right away. But then she just starts laughing almost, almost hysterically. <laughs> <laughs> almost like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, what did I do? And why are we, it brings me back to like, uh, uh, in our talk about like Happy Death Day, uh, the first one, Spo- uh, spoilers if you haven't seen our video for that yet, and if you haven't seen Happy Death, they skip 30 seconds. But when she finds out, you know, who the killer is, and she's just kind of like, over a guy? You know, it's, it's that, right. it's a similar kind of like framework, but it's also just, they both, it's both them laughing over, just like, oh my God, I literally just pushed you and almost started a fight. <laughs> over a guy. Over a guy. However. Your sister, it's the end of the world. We have everyone's so many dead. more problems than this right now. Right. Yeah. Everyone's dead. And here Everyone. I am still angry at you. <laughs> and yet, and, I can still yeah. get behind her because he is, as far as they know, the only guy. You know what she is right now? Teenager with hormones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the last guy actually matters mm-hmm. to a certain degree. Yeah, which is why she still wants to go for him. Right. In the movie. But, <laughs> but I. Uh, oh, that's, that the I I think, that's the other reason I think. That's the other reason I think that she's got to be like a sophomore to her senior and not too far apart. Is because like if you're able yeah. to steal guys from her, then you have to be. Yeah. 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 
but also there is that but also enough of a space that like it's that big sister thing where just kind of like she's going to get to do everything first and everybody well, thinks the world of her and then there's me kind of thing which also, i yeah i also have to i mean that is a very valid point but i also want to dig a little deeper and think how how often did she actually steal the guys or is it just mm. like oh i think that boy's cute and then you get to go out with him like Ex you, that's you that's up? what i felt did you make yeah. a move yeah no no it's just yeah it's just feeling. Actively it's, stealing. It's, yeah it, it felt more emotion based than fact based but i i get I that because when you're a teenager yeah yeah and do nothing about it and you stole them from me yeah you oh god i mean i i like i've married guys in my mind just this year <laughs> and, uh -huh. But uh, I know we were what talking it about is. Bruce Campbell in Evil Dead 2, you wanted to marry him. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, on my Instagram, I mean, five times a day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I know what it is now. When I was a teenager, I was, you know, holding my heart and crooning uh, theater love duets solo, you know, to <laughs> the guy who I'll never get to sing with and everything like that, you know, just like, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know what I was doing because I was in the closet. I mean, okay, we're getting deeply personal, but it was an emotional time. So I understand, like you, I agree with you. I, I, I can see everywhere that Samantha's coming from with that, but I love the fact that like it's confronted and then immediately kind of like distilled into exactly what it is which is not the most important thing yes. <laughs> we addressed it yeah but what are we doing what am i doing I, god i'm embarrassed and you know and, and I, wonder, <laughs> I always wonder how how much of that again because writing girls is difficult as a man right and mm. one of the things is is they they start laughing and i you know i wonder if that's just like a guy's way of saying this is trivial or like, I don't know how to end the scene. Or of course they would just mm. laugh because they're girls and they're sisters, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> so I have to wonder how much of that was written the way you're describing it mm. or how much of it is the two of them as actors yeah. making that text mean that. And I'd making like to work. think, I think it's them making it work. Like really I'd, I'd, be, I'd be willing to, yeah, I'd, I'd put money on that. <laughs> yep. But, um, and they both really sell the fuck out of that. I can't, I can't stress enough mm. how excellent Kelly Maroney and Catherine Mary Stewart are, not only in things, but specifically in this thing. Specifically. Yeah, and to, and to know that they got along as well as they did and that they, that they it just clicked. Yep. Like, to know that, like, basically, like, they, cause the first scene Kelly Maroney said that they shot was when she comes home, uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, when it's just happened and like do you even know what's happening and everything like that and she said something in it because they didn't even audition together uh they got to the final round of auditions and Catherine mary stewart was reading with somebody and kelly was reading with somebody else and they found out they had each gotten the roles with people they didn't read with so they were like how do they know that we're going to be able to play these roles and then they they met and they did the, they shot the first scene and they were like oh this is easy <laughs> yeah this is great they really did hire the the, the right person to play my sister because uh, you are my sister okay awesome and uh, knowing that because i mean there are people who have chemistry on screen who don't get along but no so it's just like oh, an yeah. extra added little like you know like skip my make my heart skip one extra beat just because i know like and they really like each other right you know they really get along and they feel like they could like we could we could have made a series God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway Good movie. Thank you for bringing it into my life, John Carlos. Yes, and and thank you for liking it because it'd be super awkward for me. I, I generally, I had a good feeling going in. I'm like, he's gonna like this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thanks for joining me. Good times. Yeah, uh, we'll do this again soon. And I don't know when exactly, but you bet your ass we'll be doing Chopping Mall with Kelly Maroney for sure. And I think probably, and I, and I think probably the apple. Now that we've, <laughs> oh my god, it's it's yeah. that's gonna be a hard one to do. Just because uh, half of the fun of that to me is, it's just gonna be a video of us like me singing the songs, and I'm like, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not a real video, so we can't do it. But you know, 
Same thing, like we did Grease 2, I would spend a whole Grease 2 discussion just like singing Cool Rider and singing Reproduction <laughs> and singing Prowlin', which is like one of the stupidest. Oh my God. Oh, I love it. I, I can't. Especially, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. this I could talk I, about. Those, I don't know how I could focus. Like you think, you know, when we talk about a franchise and we record for like four hours and break it up into videos, I yeah. feel like I could, I don't want to, but I feel like I could do four hours on, on Grease 2. And two yeah. hours of that would just be me recreating Cool Rider. <laughs> <laughs> and just contextually like drawing connections, like because it's lived in our lives for like so long. I, I, I would have every story in the book because Grease yeah. 2 almost predates memory. Like it was my <laughs> second Michelle Pfeiffer movie. The Apple, at least, I only have a few years, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, Grease 2 but is I one still of those, have a lot to say. Grease yeah. 2 is one of those rare bad movies that I both like ironically, but also <laughs> I like it unironically. I like legitimately really like Grease 2 and fuck you for judging me. <laughs> 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 I legitimately oh. adore that film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Uh, well, we'll come back with something. I'm not sure what yet, but Chopping Mall is for sure in the future. Yeah. Look for it. Until next time. <laughs>